Jesus. Zambia, good morning. Um, I can add for this Yes, my name is Nyakan Jun, the CEO and founder for the Timeless Women of Wanda organization, also CEO of the Timeless Dynamic Services Limited. Um, we're going to be having a very exciting time today as um, we go through our virtual review process in preparation for the Africa Funding Tour that's scheduled for August this year. It's really good to see Zambia very vibrant and on the call today. Uh, very dynamic. Um, we're really excited to engage with you. I hope that you're all bright and, uh, and, and sharp and ready to engage because this is one of the very, very important processes um, on this, uh, you know, on these two our, to our plans. I'd love to begin with um, introductions, okay? I'll introduce um, our teams um, and the teams that are really working very hard to, to ensure that this process delivers a successful outcome for all of you project owners. Uh, once um, I make the introduction, I will come back again and give the overview and the objective of this call um, in light of the overall objective of the Africa Funding Tour. Um, and then we will hear a little bit uh, about yourselves, you know, a little bit about who you are, your expectations for this call as well. And then we will kick off with, um, with the review process. I hope that uh, shares, shares you know, a good, a good uh, out, outline for, for today's call. So on this call uh, with me today is Dr. Roland Roberts, who is actually the CEO uh, for Courageous. And uh, he's an advisor to, to national governments. And he's an entrepreneurship expert, an advisor to a lot of enterprises globally. Uh, Courageous and Timeless Dynamic Services are partnering to deliver the first ever pioneered Africa funding tour that will be taking place in six countries. Welcome, Dr. Roland. Thank Welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> wonderful to be with you today. Yes. Good morning. Yes. I know it's very early on your end. You know, it's a very, very early morning on your end. Thank you for being on the call. My yeah. pleasure. You know, I've really been looking forward to spending time uh, with our friends in Zambia. And uh, the, the process that they've gone through to prepare even to be on this call and to visit with us today. And I'm just thrilled to help uh, advance their preparations so that uh, the investors that we uh, put them in front of in August, that they uh, present their best possible uh, face for the business. And, um, you know, we've worked very hard, as you know, to really pair up investors that have a heart for Africa investors that uh, do not just want to bring money. In fact, uh, if that, that's all they brought, they probably would not be interested. They want to, uh, they believe in the economic power of, of the continent of Africa and that it is the last economic frontier in the world. And so they, they, are, they are investors of vision, not your normal investor. Uh, they, and, and so that's why I think it's just a unique time uh, and, and I would also remind everyone that these are folks that have investors that have agreed to travel internationally, uh, even, uh, you know, immediately after a pandemic. Uh, and we even hope that the uh, international airports are open for travel, you know, which we believe they are, it will be. Uh, but, but it is still, there's a lot of fear for people in different parts of the world. And so we are very grateful that they believe in what uh, in you, uh, they believe in your businesses, and uh, and the tenacity, and just the the economy um, of of Zambia. And entrepreneurship is the single greatest economic engine that any country can can stimulate to grow. Uh, and so I believe that what we're doing here today is one of the greatest things we can do and the greatest thing for the economy uh, that we can do for Africa. So thank you, Nyakin, as well for all of your hard work and your team, the advisory, uh, the advisory team and the valuation teams and 
just thank you everyone for, for, for the processing bringing us to this point. No, thank you, Dr. Roland. In fact, um, you, know, uh, you know, I just want to speak a little bit about Zambia. You know, it brings a light to my heart, you know. Um, I call Zambia one of the hidden treasures of Africa. You know, a small country that most people do not know about, you know, the world stage is not so, so, so aware of what, what kind of country it is, what opportunities are there, what treasures lie in there, in the people, and, and you know, all the resources that are there. You know, Zambia is a country um, that has a population of about 17 to 18 million people. You know, um, it's fast growing. Very interesting to see that 85% of its um, population is young. It's a youth. You can imagine how much untapped, uh, you know, potential wow. there is. You know, workforce, the workforce, the future workforce, you know, yes. because young people are the workforce of a nation. So, you know, a key factor. For, for driving economic transformation and economic growth. I mean, when you look at the sectors that they have, that's quite untapped, that really, really lies, you know, follow with uh, re really great opportunities for investors and entrepreneurs to engage in, you know, you're looking at the mining sector. They have a lot of minerals, you know, they're one of the largest countries that, that produce copper, you know, Zambia. Um, mm -hmm. They've got a spread of minerals all over. Uh, they have small scale mining that there's great opportunity to, to, to really grow in. And uh, the entrepreneurs that are on our call and are, that are on the tour are, you know, are some of the people who are trying to drive growth in these areas. They have, you know, a, a hugely, um, you know, op, you know uh, sp span of arable land. Agriculture is one of their key areas of production and one of the key areas that, you know, uh, both the entrepreneurs and the investors will be looking at. Okay. Um, their education sector, you know, with a lot of public education going on in the country, but a demand for private school education mm. presents, you know, great opportunity in, in the learning and education area, especially now when you look at the COVID, um, you know, pandemic, the need and the, and the demand for online learning and, you know, coupled with that demand for private sector, lots of opportunities in Zambia. You're looking at the tourism sector, quite largely untapped. And a lot of local Zambians now trying to position themselves to play into this area because it's an area that has been played in by a lot of foreigners, which sort of locks out the locals from really enjoying that potential. And, um, you know, Michelle later, you know, I'll introduce her later, but she, she definitely will be sharing some of the, the submissions that are on this um, tour for tapping into the tourism space and housing. Can you imagine they have a deficit of three to five million housing? houses you know mm. there's such a deficit in the housing and construction sector so quite quite a vibrant country and uh, part of the reason that um I'm, I'm really really excited to for us to be leading and, and 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 doing this tour as we open up you know opportunities and spaces in in some of these countries that people do not hear about for me it's hidden treasures that have been discovered at this point in time so zambians and zambia you know thank you so much so excited to have you on the call we're really excited and looking forward to engaging with all of you today as we see how this tour will really really position yourselves as drivers of um, of, of of you know growth for your country uh, zambia has a very high rate of uh, unemployment and almost 80 to 90 percent of the population is poor living under almost a dollar a day so when you're looking at game changer for you know economic growth enterprise enterprise development entrepreneurs are going to be the driver and helping entrepreneurs to really tap into that opportunity to be able to create wealth to change the status of the economics in that nation so really 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 excited to be on this call today and see how together with you entrepreneurs and, and, and all the partners on the call, you know, how we can be able to enhance this whole process to ensure that, that at the end, we have a very favorable outcome. Um, next on the call, I'd love to introduce um, Jacqueline Shishimba. Jackie, are you online? Hi, Nyakan. Yes, I am online. Good morning and good morning to Roland. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, Jacqueline. So Jacqueline uh, Chishimba is our Timeless uh, Women Network representative in Zambia. She leads and, uh, and, and executes all our Timeless programs in the country and obviously is lead for all the great entrepreneurs who are on the call today. Um, Jackie is you know, a very seasoned leader in her own right, an entrepreneur. She is a, you know, an MD for Brandline Africa and executive director for Isonitize. So very, very, you know, 
uh, forward thinking visionary leader herself. Uh, Jacqueline, welcome, welcome to the call. Maybe you can give us some perspective of, of Zambia, the entrepreneurs and the expectations that, that you have for today. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Roland. And again, thank you very much to all the Zambian entrepreneurs that are on the call this morning. I want to be very categorical and indicate that Zambian entrepreneurs are ready. Um, Zambian entrepreneurs are eager. Zambian entrepreneurs are looking for funding. Locally, our funding is very expensive. Um, entrepreneurs would want to source money, uh, acquire funding, access funding from our local banks. However, the interest rates are very high. Um, sometimes we shoot up to 35%, come down, the lowest could be 22%. And of course, we cannot compete locally with, for instance, the Chinese. Is, and the Indians, let me just accessing funding out of their percent interest rate, and we are not. And then they are highly supported by their governments. So their governments will give them money and tell them, look, you can pay back over a period of 25 years. And they're able to come into this country and set up industry, um, obviously with a lot of money being siphoned out and not staying in the country. And thus disadvantaging the Zambian entrepreneur. So when entrepreneurs come together on a platform such as ours, they are very um, anxious about, you know, finding funding that is well-structured, number one. Funding that is win-win. So they will make profits that, you know, they can reinvest in the country and develop Zambia, whilst at the same time knowing that the investor is happy as well. Number two, um, they're very aware of the laws of this country, uh, meaning that even when the investment comes, they will work within the law. I mean, I cannot uh, say everybody will be as, you know, there's integrity for everyone, but at the same time, I can say that the group that we have really are people, some of them have a track record of high integrity, even in their small businesses. Then number three, I think a lot of us Zambians have woken up to the fact that our challenges require our solutions. And our solutions mean, look, we have to dive into the industrial sphere. We have to set up the manufacturing industry. We have to go into construction and housing and, and look at what is missing, the deficit. We have to fill it in ourselves. Number four, Zambians have to start competing at an entrepreneurial level at an international level sphere or space. Um, we have noticed how uh, we have seen a number of East and West African local business entities actually operating in the region, not just in the East African region, but even coming to Southern Africa, uh, a number of chain stores. And, and Zambians are hungry for that, you know. They're just looking for the correct funding and the correct business guidelines and guidance so that they're also able to operate uh, regionally. Uh, number five, uh, Zambians are willing to partner. Zambians have woken up to the fact that, look, if we do not partner, we're not going to grow. So it's no longer about a one-man show. It's just not about um, this sole trader. It's about understanding the power of synergies. If there is an entrepreneur investor in the U.S. that wants to come into a partnership, enter into a partnership with a Zambian entrepreneur, I can assure you that these entrepreneurs are actually sitting on this particular platform. They want to partner, uh, they want to go it 50-50, they want to go it 60-40, of course, according to the laws of Zambia, the Zambian has to earn um, or own you know, slightly more shares by nature of being indigenous, but of course, also depends on funding. If it's equity, um, then obviously the funder will probably have a slightly upper hand but we are all awake to that fact. And, and I would tell you that um, even the government of Zambia, uh, despite our reserves not looking so good, does really support Zambian entrepreneurs by emphasizing every day that pick up the opportunities, find the partners. If you can find the funding, you know, perform, employ other people, grow the sectors. Um, we have sectors such as uh, manufacturing and textiles that over the years have not done so well. But right now we do have entrepreneurs that 
are experts in that field, uh, have the passion field, and are actually producing textile uh, material at a small rate. So already you can tell that with, with support, with funding, the textile industry could actually wake up again in this country. Agriculture is another sector. Uh, because of mineral price fluctuations on the market, copper, um, well, of course, I'm glad to inform you that Zambia has just discovered huge reserves of gold. So uh, there's a huge debate around that. And Zambians are, again, looking forward to tap into that sector of mining. But I was speaking about agriculture. Um, because of the turbulence in the mining sector, the last 10 years, Zambians have have slowly uh, grown the agriculture sector. And what is lacking now is processing and value addition. I'm sure we do have some farmer entrepreneurs on the forum today who want to venture into processing at a large scale. Our honey, um, locally natural honey produced, is highly sought in Europe and the United States. And we have a few success stories under AGOA. Uh, but of course, we need more, and, and that already is, is income for our entrepreneurs. So in a nutshell, I, I, I really want to emphasize that um, the team we have, the entrepreneurs we have, are entrepreneurs of passion, of expertise, of eagerness, and there's more in the country. All we're lacking is funding, decent funding, win-win funding, not for a Zambian to benefit and not an investor, but for a Zambian to benefit and an investor to, to grow industry, to create employment, and to fill the gaps of the challenges that we've just you know, discussed earlier on through Nyakan. Thank you very much. No, um, thank you so much, Jacqueline. You've done justice to you know, providing that perspective, you know, um, giving depth and insight of, of the landscape um, and current state, you know, um, of Zambia. And we're really, really excited to see how this call will enrich, you know, some of those expectations, um, answer some of those questions and provide uh, clarity and opportunity for everybody who's on this call. I really love everything that you've said and I'm really, really excited to have you on the call. Um, next, I would love to invite um, Molly, uh, Miss Molly Maneki. Molly, are you on the call already? Molly? Yeah, hello. Good morning. Wonderful, Molly. Yeah, I'd love to introduce Molly. Molly is a Timeless Regional uh, Program Lead, uh, uh, you know, at Timeless, and working very closely with all the countries. Um, Molly, good morning. You can share a few remarks. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, I am glad that we all connected to this virtual review. And uh, I am so glad to see so many people from Zambia and I'm hoping that you're going to interact. And uh, also, as part of this process that we, we will get some, a, a few pointers and guidelines on how we're going to uh, strengthen our, our executive summaries and how, how we're going to present our, ourselves even during the funding tour. And I'm looking for, Look forward to a very interactive and very impactful session and thank you all for being here. All right, thank you Molly. I'm glad to have you on the call. Um, so a process such as like this has a lot of intricate parts that happen behind the scenes, you know, uh, in order to get us where we are and, and even, even, you know, post uh, a virtual call, we're going to engage a lot of back end processes that are going to ensure that we're getting to the end, you know, um, in a very strong manner that presents the best outcomes for everybody. Um, and so we have a team of, you know, legal advisors, business um, analysts, uh, business support, um, you know, people um, who have been working, you know, with, the, with the, all, all the submissions and all the project owners in the countries. Um, uh, that technical team is led by Cecilia Kaisha, um, who is actually the lead for Underwriting Africa heading you know all that work that's that's happening behind the scenes and uh, she'll be joining us on the call at some point but she's represented on the call today by Michelle Mocha. Michelle Mocha is one of the lead analysts who's worked together with all the other analysts and business support um, teams that are that have been you know uh, appraising all these uh, executive summaries that we've received from the six countries and um, you know I'm sure she's on the call right now 
Um, I just love her to, to say hello. Um, Michelle, are you on the call already? Yes, I am. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Um, welcome, Michelle, really great to have you on the call. I know we'll be hearing from you a lot um, at a later part in the call, but please, um, if you can give you some, some remarks, you know, just to say hello to the teams. Hello, Zambia. I'm actually glad and honored to be analyzing the entrepreneurial ideas from Zambia. As Nyakan has said, it's a little gem in Africa, and, and I think the world needs to hear your story. So I'll be speaking more about the things we have reviewed later on. Thank you, Nyakan. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you so much for being on the call. Yeah, um, so shortly we'll be moving over to you, Project Owner. We want to hear a little bit about you, about what you're doing, what your enterprises are doing, and your expectations from this call, because this call is about you. It's about working with you, working with you, and supporting you to be able to strengthen your submissions, get clarity on the process, and have the best possible outcome in August when we're in your countries. But before we go on to that, I just want to go back and give a high level view of the process, um, you know, um, end to end of this Africa funding tour. So like I said at the beginning of the call, um, through Timeless and Courageous, uh, led by Dr. Roland and myself, um, and all the teams that are involved in the back end, including your teams in the country countries, um, we've put together the first ever Pioneer uh, Africa funding tour that's going to take place in six countries in Africa. Um, one of the reasons why we've put together this um, kind of tour is to be able to, to make linkages between key key partners, you know, um, people who, who you know have the, the the financial capacity, they have money, they have they would love to invest in the African continent, but they have no, you know, they've not found you know um, room or opportunity to put that money in in a place that they can get a good return, and ideas, uh, projects, and enterprises that are in the continent of Africa that are really, really vibrant, have high potential, but do not have that financing. So we're putting that, that um, you know, we're bridging that gap and facilitating that linkage. But the bigger goal is to really, really play a, a central part in Africa's growth story. And, you know, Africa by and large, you know, has attained political independence. You know, we are at different stages as countries on that, but at least every country has attained political independence. What's really glaringly lacking in, in the African continent is economic, economic um, independence. And uh, we find that there's a great opportunity at this point in time and stage of our growth cycle as a continent to be able to take responsibility of the problems that are facing the continent and, and solve these problems while we're creating wealth at the same time. Okay? And the, the best uh, uh, you know, lever for driving Africa's economic growth is through enterprise development. When you look at the population that, that you know, the young population of Africa and the statistics that have, the, you know, that we see globally, that, you know, almost 70% of the world's youth will be in Africa within the next 10 years. That really speaks a lot, you know, um, for, for workforce, you know, and also for a need for building enterprises. We can't have that many jobs, you know. To, to take in all these young people who are coming out into industry, but you know, may likely be unemployed. And we also know that unemployment leads to a lot of you know, other vices, you know, uh, crime rates and, and all these things. We want to mitigate it in advance. And so uh, building enterprises and supporting enterprises to grow is really, really key. So beyond the money equation, linking you know, people who've got money with, with projects that need money, uh, Dr. Roland and, and, and I are more geared and more passionate about solving the bigger equation of Africa's economic transformation and bringing tangible, sustainable solutions that works across all sectors, you know, that's empowering young people, that's, that's you know, unlocking the potential of industry, that's harnessing the opportunities on the continent, that's bringing the linkages of finance, it's providing markets, you know, all these different things. And so you will see along, along the way, you know, that on the funding tour, there's also other interventions that we will be providing to meet these other aspects that we're talking about. So as a start, you know, uh, being a pioneering tour, we are, you know, uh, going to be uh, touring uh, six, maximum seven countries, hopefully, um, in this August tour. And the countries that are, that are involved in this tour include Kenya, Rwanda, Zambia, Botswana, Malawi, 
uh, and South Africa. And um, what we want to do is to be able to, 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 to engage with enterprise and project owners in these countries, you know, um, to be able to make those linkages, support these enterprises, not just with money, but with technical expertise, advisory, and some of the things that will be so uniquely uh, required by each of these enterprises to be able to grow and to thrive. I really like what Jackie, you said earlier, you know, we're looking for a win-win. What will make the entrepreneurs uh, successful and what will give value to our investors, okay? So a win-win is really, is really um, one of the things that we're trying to, to achieve. And along the, the, the call, obviously through the engagement, you know, we will see the various you know, ways in which that we, we're trying to, to achieve this. So without um, much ado, I'd really love to move along, along onto a, a, a time of this, this call where we want to hear from the entrepreneurs and the project owners that are on the call, you know, just to share what, you, you know, your name, your sector, you know, the project that you're engaging and what are your expectations uh, for being on this call, okay? Um, in terms of process uh, for the tour, we, we have already um, sent out um, requests and calls for submissions for executive summaries for each of the projects. This already has happened in the six countries. We are now at the stage where these have been reviewed and we're giving you know, that um, review back to you, giving insights and recommendations from our technical team. That's what this virtual review call is about. After that, there will be an opportunity for a resubmission, you know, um, having strengthened your submission further to increase your, your chances for a better outcome at the end of this process. And the tail end of that process is going to be um, a physical tour in each of your countries, the two day tour in each of the countries in August, you know, where each of you will have an opportunity, you know, to engage and come before investors and, and you, know, you know, talk about your project and, and, and those linkages happen. We hope um, that there will be successful you know, projects, you know, that interest the, the, the investors. And where those are, that's the case, the investors are going to make uh, verbal offers within those two days with, um, you know, all the legalities being tied out about a week or two after the tours uh, in each country. So in terms of those, that process, it's a high level process that, um, that you know, you need to keep in mind and, and keep just flowing along, along with us. All projects um, are going to make it to the end as long as you do your part as long as you make the submissions when you need to make them, as long as you engage in the process and flowing through you know, all the guidelines that have been provided, then I think all of you will make it to the end. Okay? Now, um, obviously Michelle will talk about what the end looks like. You know? Even though we all make it to the end, it's your level of preparation and the strength of your pro project that will guarantee the outcomes. And uh, Michelle at some point will be talking about that. So um, I'll move over now to the project owners. Um, we'll go by the order that's on my screen, okay? Um, just introducing yourself, your name, your project, what sector is your project, and what do you expect out of this call? I'll begin with Lehem Enterprise, you're first on my screen. Um, could you just introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit more about you, what you expect on the call, and what sector your project is in? Yeah. Okay, I had to unmute. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for having us uh, on this call. Uh, my name is uh, Peggy Katontoka. I'm the co-founder of uh, Lehem Enterprise. We are into agriculture. Our, um, what brings us here is the project on drones, uh, because we have suffered a lot of things as smallholders. That's why we thought we could improve our, our productivity using drones. I think that's more, it's more than you have asked. Uh, I'm not here alone, but I've got my co-founder as well here. Hi, everyone. My name is Billy. I'm the co-founder of Lehem Enterprises. Yes, we are passionate about our project, incorporating emerging technologies into agriculture especially in the space of the smallholder farmers because they seem to be lagging behind. So we're looking forward to um, a time where we can actually, the tide of technology can lift them up from low productivity, low incomes to a place of higher productivity and, low income, and higher incomes. 
So we are excited to um, go through this process and uh, we look forward to get more knowledge and share what we know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peggy. Peggy and what is your name again, sir? Billy. What is your name, sir? Billy. My name Thank is you Billy. so much, Peggy and Billy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy and Billy. Yeah, um, really, really great. No, you've not gone much. That's just good enough. You've introduced yourself quite well for us to understand what you're doing on the, you know, in your project and the sector that you're in. And obviously the vibrancy and, and the passion that you have is, is, is visible. Yeah, Dr. Roland, mm -hmm. you, would you like? Uh, yes, I, I just, I, I'm looking forward to, to learning more. I love the drone industry. I think it's, it's definitely expanding. When it's, when it's that successful, uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, I, I specifically see opportunities. I think uh, in safety areas of safety, uh, it reduces costs instead of sending out actual helicopters for uh, emergencies or for issues uh, to monitor traffic or or uh, any other type of issues, uh, crowd control and so forth. Drones are a safe way of doing it, uh, and I like also like it for businesses uh, to showcase their their facilities and their. Uh, real estate and people who are selling homes and people selling office buildings. So I think it's a great business. And, I'll, and I love service businesses uh, because service businesses uh, do usually do not require a lot of capital, but you can still make mm -hmm. a lot of money. The upside is high. The downside is low. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, next on my screen is Zemba Katongo. And uh, for Peggy, and, and once you speak, kindly mute back your phone. Just mute back your, 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 you know, your mic. Yeah, yeah. Zemba Katongo, you're next up on my screen. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Go ahead. My name is Zemba. I'm a 28 year old and hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Zimba. We can hear you. Okay, so I'm the co founder of uh, Masabi. Masabi is the translation, direct translation of fish in Kaunde, my native language. So my business is I supply fresh green fish. Um, looking at the the, the the situation in Lusaka right now, where I am, not everyone provides the kind of fish that I provide. I have a few competitors, but their their supplies aren't as as good as the quality that I provide. I'm I'm currently out of employment, so I decided to venture into something of my own. Um, of course, the the situation in Zambia when it comes to jobs is quite scarce. So I decided to do something of my own. So my project uh, is going to it works with uh, well. What I want to do with my project is to simplify how how the fish supply is going to be. So this is in connection with deliveries. Uh, I'm looking at code rooms also, not just in Lusaka, but I also want to tap into other provinces within Zambia. So this is... I think um, his connection seems to have to work in line with. Technologies such as websites and also delivery. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Zimba. I, I think um, we, we have a good understanding uh, of the fish supply business and uh, a unique type of fish that you provide and um, really looking to grow beyond Masaka and delivery options and, and other 
provinces and regions of, of Zambia. Uh, so congratulations. I really like how you said, you know, instead of the employment, because job uh, creation was not an op option for you, you ended up starting the business. Uh, and once again, I think that that is the right behavior. And now you're, you're learning how to create value. Uh, and, and entrepreneurship is not easy. Uh, it, you, you, it's, it takes a lot of work. But I would rather work 80 hours for myself than 40 hours for someone else who, who tells me, you know, when I can take a day off. <laughs> so it's always better to invest in yourself. If an employer was willing to invest in you for a job, uh, don't you think that you're worth even more to invest in yourself? So I think you're doing the right thing and, and a very unique business for sure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, J Jackie, would you like to, to flow along um, with yourself and also with your enterprises? I think, um, you know, feel free. Okay, sure. Th thank you, Nathan. Um, I I'll start with the first one, um, Peggy and, and Billy that talked about the drones. And mm -hmm. I'll just like to indicate that um, I, th I think with COVID-19 pandemic, we have to embrace technology whether we like it or not. There'll be less contact, human contact as we go along because the pandemic and people need to be um, very careful where they go and you know where they're coming from. So um, I think they're doing a great job already thinking about the drones. Um, already I know that the World Food Program in Zambia will be feeding about a million people that have been affected by um, hunger because of COVID-19. And, and clearly, if uh, there's, there's, there's drones that are going to be used, you, they might actually find themselves tapping into a niche of not only um, agriculture inputs that are required to be delivered by drones or lessons, but probably even medication and foodstuffs like we've seen in other countries where they're being delivered by drones. So that is good. Um, coming to um, the fish um, entrepreneur, I'm sorry, I didn't catch his name clearly. Do you have that, Nyakan? Zemba. Z -E Zemba. 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 Yes, coming to, to Zemba um, on fish. The consumption of fish in Zambia is very high, and there's no one particular um, industry right now, whether big or small, that is meeting the demand. Apart from that, we have other industries or players in the fish industry that are actually uh, fishing from Zambia, but are feeding the DRC. And that's because the DRC market is, is very lucrative in that their pricing is extremely high and it's in US dollars. So you have those that are really concentrating specifically on the DRC. Uh, but Zambia itself, no one manufacturer is meeting the demand for fish. So Zemba is actually um, in a space where um, he has great potential to grow. And, and I'm sure if we were to ask him further, he probably knocks off every day without any fish in the fridge. And, and because of, of um, health reasons, Zambians have also learned to move away from a lot of red meat. People are consuming more of white meat. So chicken and fish um, are highly preferred on the table right now in the country. Um, yes, so already you can see that our entrepreneurs are moving with the times and, and they're reading. And apart from yeah. not having a job, he picked an industry where he knew that the demand is high. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jackie. I think our enterprises are doing really great and uh, you know, I can't wait to see what Michelle will be sharing with us later. Um, next on my screen is Mwansa. Mwansa. Mwansa, go ahead. You can unmute your microphone and, and, then, and then speak. Monsa? Hello, Jacqueline. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Monsa. Okay. Mwanza, I have yes, you. Okay, go ahead. Thank There's you. A... Okay. Yeah, sure. No problem. Go ahead. 
Okay, my name is Chiwazia Mwanza. I'm the co-founder of Lake Farms Fisheries Company. I'm here with my co-founder, Katie Shamakamba. Uh, we are into aquaculture. Uh, specifically, we deal with crayfish and uh, now tilapia. We have farms in uh, Siavonga and in Sinazongwe. We have cages on the lake and we have employed um, uh, several youths and women who harvest the fish and who harvest the crayfish and we take it to markets. We sell to uh, high-end uh, restaurants and um, mostly we found the Asian community are the ones that love the crayfish and we also supply to the Asian community here in Zambia. We've also exported to uh, South Africa and to Hong Kong. But with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, situation happening, we, we are mostly now focused uh, on servicing the local uh, markets. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, I worked for uh, Yalelo, one, the largest uh, aquaculture company in Africa. And from there on, uh, we started our own uh, uh, food uh, uh, aquaculture company in Zambia. And I'm happy to say that we are one of the largest uh, uh, aquaculture companies in Zambia so far. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Josh. Uh, question, what year did you start your business? Uh, how long have you been in business? Uh, when did you start it? Our business was registered in 2016. 2016, okay. And how much revenue did you do last year? Titles, yeah, are you there? Do you have the revenue figures? Yes, yes, I'm there. Sorry, I, 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 I didn't get the last question that Dr. Roberts asked. What, uh, how much revenue are you doing? We are doing about uh, fifty to hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. From twenty years. And how much funding are you seeking? We are looking at uh, half a million dollars. We want to set up uh, the largest uh, crayfish and now tilapia filleting plant in the southern part of Africa. We are based in uh, Lake Kariba. Uh, it's the largest uh, uh, lake in the world. And we want to really put up a high-tech, state-of-the-art facility that will be able to support Fly crayfish because there's no one out there who the markets and we want to set up a real MDA. All right, very good. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mwanza. Um, really appreciate it. Um, Jackie, you, Jackie, I have another lady called Mwanza's. I'm, you know, <laughs> how do we distinguish and get her to speak? <laughs> Mwanza's. And so lock your. So with a Z, it's Mwanza. With an S, it's Mwansa. Okay, can Mwansa speak? <laughs> Mwansa, can you unlock um, your mic and speak? Dr. Roland, could you help to undo her mic? Yes. <laughs> So well, I think uh, we should go to the next for now. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think All right. So yeah. So the next person on my screen um, in order is A N G, A N G. A N G. Hello, everyone. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. My name is George uh, Simango. I'm yes. Zambian. I'm Zambian. I live in Botswana. But I've got a project with my two other colleagues in Zambia. The, the other two, one is Moswana, and the other one is a Zambian. Mm -hmm. okay, the Zambian gentleman, you know, who is uh, in this project, who is not here right now, you know, he's, um, he's an architect by profession. Mm -hmm. He's running a successful high-profile architectural firm in Botswana. It's called CPM Architects. And uh, he's not with us today because he lost his wife uh, two years ago, two, I mean, two days ago. He's got a funeral. Oh, no. And he's the person who should have spoken, you know, on the technical aspect of the project because that is his area as an architect. So Mr. Ma his name is Mr. Malenga. He is not with us here. Well, Mike, okay. so the George, George. Yes. Uh, my condolences to him and might I just say uh, I am very thankful that he is where he should be today uh, because that does not hurt him in any way and, and I have been in those situations before where I made the wrong decision I should have been with family and instead I thought the business was more important and so my priorities were not correct in a situation similar and so I, I, I just commend uh, the character um, that, uh, that he is displaying and uh, appreciate you uh, stepping in. Okay, all right. No, thank you, Dr. Roland, uh, Robert, you know, for that to actually convey the, the messages to him. Okay, so the other partner that we have, the one with the Moswana, is running, you know, different business. He's a very successful businessman here in Botswana. He's, he's running some family businesses and they're doing a lot of things. Uh, they're into housing or they're also into trading, clothes and so forth. They run a lot of supermarkets and so forth. They're also into agriculture where they supply you know, agriculture implements to the farming community of Botswana. So, so what we have done, the three of us have partnered together so that you know, we can embark in this, on this project in Zambia. I myself also, I run two businesses. I'm a managing partner of an audit firm. It's called Absent Partners here in Botswana. We are certified auditors. I also run a, a management consulting firm. So what we have done, we have come together so that we can set up you know, a hotel and also a level three hospital in Chilanga, Zambia. So that is our project uh, that we have and um, Basically, I know uh, that kind of business is quite uh, tight um, when you look at competition and everything. So what our strategy is basically to brand ourselves in a very, very different way. We looked at the location. We looked at the needs that are there in Zambia. For example, when we look at the, when we are looking at the two businesses as well, the Zambian population has grown. We're talking about 17 to 18 million people. And we can see See, there's a huge gap in terms of service delivery on the medical side and then also on the hospitality industry. Of course, you know, we are going to be guided more by Jacqueline and those who are in Zambia right now. We can see also there's a huge gap uh, in terms of the hospitality industry because Zambia's economy is growing. So there will be people traveling into Lusaka from within the country and from outside the country who come to do business, you know, are coming for tourism. Tourism is also another industry which is growing in Zambia as well. So I would like to take advantage of those op emerging opportunities so that we can place ourselves nicely in Chilanga. Chilanga is about 15 kilometers from Lusaka. So we are looking at taking, you know, business, eh, from Lusaka, excess business that will be coming into Lusaka. So basically, this is what will be... Uh, there's a project we are going into. The, the hospital business is going to be a level three referral hospital. We are looking at taking a lot of business which is going out to South Africa, which is going out overseas and abroad. People, you know, desire to, to go outside because Zambia cannot provide some of those uh, high level medical facilities. So we would like to take most of that business 
Uh, so we are, with the, we are talking about a state-of-the-art kind of hospital in terms of the, the building structures, in terms of the, the equipment that we are going to use, in terms of the medical facilities we are going to use, and also the, the medical staff. This is what we are looking at. And uh, this is why, you know, we thought there is a good opportunity in that area in terms of the hospital. We are also looking at, we are still researching, we intend maybe to find some partners who are already in this kind of business successfully uh, because we are not experts. As directors, we are not experts in the, we are not medical doctors and so forth. But we would like to have management that is going to run this business who are successful and who have got a track record. We are also talking about on the Foster Hotel, you know, we are also looking at probably partnering with the people who also have been successful in managing hotels, you know, in, in, in all over the world. And uh, because so that they can come in with their expertise and they can help us here and there. So this is basically uh, our project, which we have in Zambia. We have other, many other projects, but we were not ready to submit them at the deadline time that we were given. But we're hoping maybe in the next cycle, we are going to do that. So in short, this is basically what we are talking about. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, you know, generally, uh, it seems like obviously you all are all all the directors have several businesses and are involved in a whole lot of things and really the hotel and the hospital neither are kind of the sweet spot that uh, for any of the directors so why are you all are, do you just see that that's an opportunity and so wanting to try to put something together or do you already have have land and infrastructure and then trying to take it to another level I'm just trying to understand uh, if, if in fact it may be a good idea, and, and I'm sure it would work. The question is: Are is your team the one to do it, or are you already spread too thin? Okay, so yeah, basically, what we have done so far, we have moved quite a lot. You know, we've got the land already secured in Chilanga. Okay. We have bought that land. Good. Number one, and like I mentioned to you, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Is the is the land is the will the land that you've purchased house both the four star hotel and the hospital side by side? Or exactly. You, okay. It's basically on the same location. And um, in fact, as I was just explaining, if you notice, according to our executive plan, uh, we also have a staff housing project just on the same land. So we've got three projects in one. Okay, so we've got that land is already secured. What we have done is we were also in the past few years, we, we also managed to get a license with Zambia Development Agency, but I think it is expired. We need to go back and renew because we wanted to take advantage of, the, of those concessions which they give in terms of investment. Are you concerned now, about recruiting, uh, getting the qualified medical personnel, uh, given the fact that there's not currently a level three hospital there, are you concerned about uh, getting medical, the qualified pers medical personnel for it, staffing? Yes, exactly. Those are some of the tasks that we need to make sure that, you know, we put in place, you know, to get the right, the right medical doctors eh, who can run that hospital. And you know, also on our strategy is that we are going to enlarge our, our board of directors so that we can bring in medical people who are qualified in the medical field so that they can advise us properly and they can help us in many ways and so forth. Okay. And what um, funding are you requesting? Yeah, pardon? How much funding are you requesting? When we did the numbers, eh, it's, it's quite a lot. For the three projects, the the hotel the uh, the hotel the hospital and also the staff housing we are asking for about uh, 660 million dollars 660 million dollars mm. yes 
Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, George. I think that was quite elaborate. Um, I enjoyed my, you know, Dr. Roland and the rest of our team just um, passing on our condolences to, to your partner. You know, we pray that the grace of, of God is upon him and the family and, you know, that he's surrounded with love and comfort at this time. And thank you so much for stepping in to represent him. Yeah. Um, Dr. Roland and the rest, you know, I, I'm really happy to see that, um, you know, through our technical teams, uh, you know, Molly and the others, we've got cross submissions. We've got people like yesterday, we had people in Zambia, you know, um, in Malawi presenting projects that they want to do in, in Rwanda. You know, today we've got uh, George, you know, Botswana, um, who has projects in Botswana and also um, proposals for Zambia. And, and, you know, this is really a healthy way. That's why the, you know, an Africa funding tour that's covering multiple countries gives those opportunities for people who are in one country, but have opportunities, you know, um, you know, strength and, and, and interests in a different country and making, being able to make those a reality. So George, uh, thank you so much for your submission. I see um, our Timeless Women Network representative for Botswana on the call supporting him. Um, Stella, I'd love you to say hello. It's good to see you. I know that we'll be um, having a virtual review for Botswana, you know, also during its, its, its scheduled time and day, but uh, welcome, say hello. You can unmute your phone, Stella, unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Zambia. Good morning, Dr. Rowland. Good morning. Um, pleased to meet you all. This is Stella, and thank you, George, that you are there representing us. Uh, indeed, we are in a bereavement, but the Lord is with us. And thank you for your messages, Dr. Rowland. We will definitely pass it to the family. Mm. Uh, we expect your partners, George, to be on the meeting this afternoon. Um, it's, it's, it's cold here, but we are pulling through. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you. Good to have you on the call. Good to have you on the call. Super. So um, next um, up is uh, Chama Kapambwe. You can unmute and, and go ahead and introduce yourself. And then just before you do that, we've, we're quite a number on the call and uh, we really want to um, you know, do as much as possible in the time that we have, which, which is sort of like, we, we sort of have a, you know, a, an end time to, to this process. So if you could uh, you know, be efficient, just introduce yourself, your project, your sector, um, you know, what you're looking for, you know, in terms of this, this call so that we can have as many of you um, be able to speak in the time allocated. I'd love to give it a maximum of an hour for all these intros so that we can move to the other parts and be able to, to, to achieve the objectives of this call. So if that, that works, I'd love as many of you, um, you know, to, 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 to share. Um, Jackie, before uh, Chama uh, goes on, um, go ahead, you know, you can give some guidance on, on how you think this can this can work efficiently. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Nye Khan. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I th I think you can also just um, to all the entrepreneurs. Um, you could um, quickly, like Nye Khan has said, um, mention your business. One, then two. Um, in a nutshell, what you're doing. Three, what you're looking for. Um, I'll give an example of uh, the crayfish uh, industry. I think for me, they were, they were looking for fund. They're looking for funding to upscale because they are already in big business. So it's upscaling. So you could indicate whether you, you want to upscale from a certain level to another or it's first time. You can indicate it's first time. And please also just uh, quickly talk about what you've put in. We would like to know your effort. What is it that you've put in so far? Do you own a building, licenses? Just, you know, quickly throw them out. Thank you. Okay, yeah, and this is also good practice because uh, when we are at the actual uh, funding tour, the physical, you know, time, time, and being able to present yourself in a short time is going to be one of the strengths that uh, that we are trying to build. Okay, go ahead, uh, Chama. Good morning, all. Uh, this is Chama from Zambia. 
Uh, I'm a metallurgist by profession. I've actually got 28 years in the metals industry. I've run operations in copper, cobalt, and sulfuric acid. As we speak now, I'm actually sitting in DRC and uh, Sakanya area. I'm running a copper concentrator here. I've been here for the last eight years. The project I've got is basically to do with my line of work, which is uh, the mining, as I said. We try, I'm actually a co-founder of a company called Oleum Solutions. Oleum Solutions is a greenfield project looking up at setting up a sulfuric acid plant. Uh, sulfuric acid is one of the major components used in the mining industry, both in Zambia and Congo. But we are actually targeting the, mostly the DRC market because of the nature of the ore which is found in Congo. In Congo, uh, most of the ore is found in oxide form, which is actually requires a lot of acid to process it. So basically, we set up this company in July last year. Uh, myself, I'm one of the major shareholders. I've, we've got a Congolese resident in Zambia with declared interest. She's my wife. She's a minority shareholder. And two other Zambians, a mechanical engineer, and a chemical engineer and an electrical engineer. What we've done so far is we looked at the technology required. The technology is actually the same now. It's evolved over a period of time. We want to look at the, what we call a contact process, double contact process. It's a technology which is actually even used in Europe now because, of course, if I mention sulfuric acid, people will be, wow, we are polluting the environment. But we're looking at what we call a double contact process, uh, converts your sulfur to uh, captures almost 99.9 percent .9 of your sulfur emissions, so you, you actually got an environmental friendly uh, process. We downlisted to people can supply this technology. We looked at uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, um, um, uh, EPCM companies, which can do this process, and we actually shortlisted a company called this. Uh, Quindao Green Mouse from China. They did a similar project in Morocco, and we've looked at the design, we've looked at everything, and basically what we came up now was to agree on the process guarantees. And what we did now to cap to, in, ed, in order for us to be guaranteed of the process uh, guarantees, we actually uh, entice them to be part of the project to be to be like to buy equity in the project as well. So the total cost of the project uh, they actually came down in February this year. It's just that our progress has been hindered because of the because of the COVID thing. Uh, the total cost of the project is 18.4 million dollars. And they offered to get 42.5% equity in the company, which uh, brings it down to about, so they are getting in about $7.8 million. So ideally, we'll be looking for about $10 million to start the project and uh, put it to commissioning. What we've done so far, uh, what we did is we identified land in an industrial area in Indola in Zambia. The area is actually in a chief dome. Uh, Chief Twalas, Chief, Do Chief Dom, where there's, it's actually almost the, the new industrial area of Ndola, although it's falls part of Ndola rural. So it gives you a bit of in incentives in terms of uh, government rebates. And then, um, so we, it's actually near uh, Zambezi port. We've got some, it sits on Dolomite, so the Zambezi port land. There's a company which are producing lime in, that, in the same area. So we've got five acres of land from the chief dome we've signed everything we've paid for the land right now as we speak we are in the process of gazetting the land to make it to put it on title under audium solutions over and above that we've done the we've done the the eis study we've done the stakeholders meeting with the people in the surrounding areas with the chief and everyone and it got buying, so we've actually submitted the EIA proposal to the Zambia uh, Environmental Management Agency. We actually got uh, because as you go out along, you 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 get feedback from them to polish it up. We reckon we should finish the whole process of find, handing in the final proposal by end of June. Now let, let me take you back to the sulfuric acid plant. The sulfuric acid plant 
will be producing 120,000 tons of sulfuric acid. But what we've done, the plant will also be, generate, be generating three megawatts of power. We want the plant to be self-sufficient. So out of that three megawatts, the plant will be using 1.2 megawatts with a balance of 1.8 megawatts being sold into the, into the grid. We've already discussed with ZESCO and we are in the process of discussing with a government uh, department called OPPI, Office of, of, for Promoting Private Power Investment. Uh, we've also submitted our, our documents to ZDA for investment license to get a rebate of most of, of the equipment we'll be getting and of also to get rebates on, uh, on tax because we are setting up a plant in the rural area, in a, in a so-called rural area. So we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we qualify for that. Now, let me take, go back to the market. The market we've really focused on Congo because Congo right now, they haven't got, they've got the production facilities for the metals, but they've got very few sulfuric acid plants. So they are importing most of the acid from Zambia and. The, the balance of it from South Africa. Right now, there is a deficit of almost 800,000 to a million tons of sulfuric acid on an annual basis. The problem which has happened with, with Congo is uh, you may get your sulfuric acid cheap made from South Africa at $100 a ton, but the cost of transport from South Africa into DRC is almost $350 to $400 a ton. So you're landing your sulfuric acid at almost $550 a ton, which is a lot. With Zambia, we should, we, with putting up a plant in Zambia, which has got a favorable inv uh, investment climate, we'll be able to cut back that transport cost by almost over $200. So we're looking at being a very... and still offload our sulfuric acid. And we actually settled on a, say 120,000 tons per annum because we didn't want to produce, a, to make a very big sulfuric acid plant or a very small sulfuric acid plant. We looked at a plant which can just fit into the market, whether the market is flat or the market is high, we should be able to make our money as well. So in a nutshell, what we're, trying, what we're looking for is funding for the deficit of the equity. So which we're looking for almost about uh, $9 million to 9.8 million, sorry, 10.5 million dollars to kick to kick start the, the the plant. But so far, we're putting a lot of money from our own resources. As I said, we funded the we funded all the technical studies, the topography, topography, the consultants for the environmental studies, the consultants for putting in document documentation at uh, ZDA, and basically for a lot of other logistics. And we've, so far, even now, we've actually signed a memorandum of understanding with the Chief Chuala uh, uh, Royal Foundation for a lot of C CSR commitments after we start the operation, like putting up a police station, helping the local farmers, and a lot of, uh, a lot of other things. I can take, talk for the whole day, but basically, that's where we are, and we, we are actually eager that this project can take off. Thank you so Thank much, Shama. Uh, Thank you. Um, Dr. Roland, any initial thoughts uh, before we go to the next? Uh, I only it's have a question. Uh, yeah, it was very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, are all of the permits approved, or do you still have to? Is it still more permitting to no, be? The, 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 the critical, the most important permit for this type of project is the environmental impact assessment. And since, since, since uh, the stakeholders, they've got no problem, and even uh, Zema, we've had actually, this is a third round of percent because what happens is you, you put your, you, you put your scope in and everything, then they, they come back with more questions. Like right now, the questions they actually want us to clarify is how we are going to tap into the national grid and how we are going to put back our power into the national grid. So basically, I think uh, because what happens after a stakeholders meeting, you, you hand over the scope to the, to, to the environmental authority. Once they accept the scope, scope that's when you push in now your detailed uh, EIA. So we've, we've actually passed all those stages. So right now, it's actually just tying the loose ends 
say so by June we should be able to get approval for for the for the environmental uh, uh, assessment. Then the other one is Zesco because Zesco is the major player. We, we've actually we talked to CEC before there was a, some issue with CEC and government. We are, I actually had the meeting with the CEO for CEC. They could pick up our power, but then the three mega was a bit low for them. But with Zesco, we've agreed as well. In principle, we've agreed that they'll be able to offload uh, our power. They'll be able to take our power because, in any case, we are going to be tied in into the grid. So it will be we'll be loading, offloading our power into them. The only thing we need to do is we need to get approval from the OPPI. When we get approval from OPPI, we go to environmental to ERB which is the energy regulation board to agree on what, what tariffs we'll be using. But even in our models, we've used very model, modest uh, tariffs to, to make sure that we, we are still competitive. And then they, after Zesco, we've actually got a letter from their MDU saying that once we finish all those things, they'll be able to offload power from us. But, and why we've really gone for a plant which is self-sustaining is I'm sure we know in the Southern Africa, we, we, there's still a deficit of power. And we, we, we really don't want to commit ourselves to a project where half of the time it's the plant is down because you cannot produce because of lack of power. And we've, we've actually seen it in the other plants surrounding us, the, as I mentioned, the lime plants and everything. Half of the time, because of the power deficit, they are suffering with, with power. So we, we really want to hit the ground running with uh, full production, ramp up the production, as I said. We've got a management team which is experienced. As I said, they've run copper, cobalt, sulfuric acid plants in Zambia and Congo. One of the other partners is actually in South Africa working for a consulting firm, a design firm. But I've worked with him in Zambia, I've worked with him in Congo. He's worked in uh, Namibia in sulfuric acid plants. He's worked in uh, Malawi in uranium plants. So basically in terms of uh, operational experience, we, we've got the operation experience. And then as I said, we built, we, we actually demanded that the supply of the plant be part of the project because we didn't want to get a plant which two days down the line breaks down. So if they commit their money to it, then we know they are giving us a proper plant which is going to run. Yes, thank you for that. For that. Uh, I can t tell you I, I, it's well thought out and planned out and, and I'm familiar with mining uh, from growing up in West Virginia in the United States. Uh, it's a big you know, coal mining, and of course, out in Montana, a lot of natural gas and uh, minerals and so forth. Uh, and uh, the the permitting process is what scares most uh, uh, investors here, uh, yeah. because uh, some of the times we've had to wait five, six, seven years uh, going through the process of, uh, and sometimes it's at a the at the whim of a political you know leaders or or bureaucrats in government or something, and so. Uh, uh, be able, uh, you know, especially preparing for August to, to address that potential risk of what happens if, if, you know, the money is invested and then you can't start operations for two years. Uh, so that'll be something just to speak to in the future, not now, but uh, in the future. But thank you for the well, uh, yeah. well, well thought out program. Not thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Chama. It's very clear the technical expertise, you know, the number of years that you, you and your team and partners have engaged, what you've put in, you know, the, the, the studies you have done, you know, the numbers that you have, it's very clear that you've really prepared yourself. So just like Dr. Roland says, you know, just prepare for those, you know, unforeseen sort of, sort of things and the licenses and things like that. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. You know, the more we have, um, you all can see that indeed there are hidden treasures in Africa, you know, Zambia, you know, uh, from what you're listening to and seeing you know these are hidden treasures you know lots of great opportunity very sound uh, stuff coming out of this and i'm really excited i want to also encourage all the project owners on the call you're all at different stages we've got large projects we've got medium-sized projects we've got ideas we've got small projects so don't worry you're where you're at you know introduce yourself introduce your idea the spectrum of investors are for different levels so you know um just just take this call as an and as an experience to engage share what you have confidently you know you don't have to speak long or you know compare how long someone is speaking and you know how short just introduce yourself you know say what it is that that, that you're doing what your expectations are however big or however small it is okay it all matters i just want to to encourage you on that 
Yeah. So next on my screen, we have Lisa. Lisa, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Morning. Thank Lisa. you very much. How are you? Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. Um, my business is called Lily Gray Enterprises, and uh, we're based here in Lusaka, Zambia. Um, I'm a director of this business, together with my husband, Mr. Webster Sanga. It is a, um, a small enterprise, it's a um, small-scale enterprise that we're running. We, we have a piece of land in Kafue, uh, Zambia, Kafue district, and um, we've been rearing uh, goats on a small scale. It is um, five acres, and um, we want to actually go into peak of this um, business plan for executive summary is to source the funding for pig rearing. Um, we have come to realize it's a very profitable business and with essential management, production skills, um, it, it, it can grow very quickly. Um, pig meat, you know, provides um, essential um, minerals, um, especially for people who want to eat healthy. So they're eating a lot of uh, white meat, which is recommended for people with diabetes. You know, we have a lot of um, non-communicable diseases because of people's lifestyles. So we're, you know, trying to eat healthy. So white meat is um, one of the ways to go. And so as existing assets contribution is the piece of land. And um, for the pigs, uh, we already have a slab for the buildings. Well, for the first phase, we would like to start with, um, I think about 30 pigs to start with in the first step, which in 18 months will increase to about 90. Um, we want to sell the pigs as um, live weight, whole uh, pigs. Uh, then we'll also um, be able to to smoke the pig. Um, we'll be able to to have pork products, which will sell as retail. So we'll have the the loin chops, the shoulder. Uh, we'll do the the bacon, the hocks, and so when we smoke them, uh, including sausages as well, then we'll be able to supply uh, supermarket chains, butcheries. And we'll also have a retail outlet right, right there in Kafue. And um, the competition that we have for that basically is, um, uh, I think, uh, well, one of the national chains is uh, called Zambif. Um, so it is a, a well established uh, distributor for most um, meat products, including pork. Um, so our uh, our plan is to at least have 40% of market share of Kafue district and eventually even Lusaka, because Kafue is just basically about 40 kilometers outside the capital city of Lusaka. So we um, plan uh, that after we've started adding value to our product by smoking it, eventually we'll be able to tap into the Sadik um, and Komesa area to be able to export our products. So um, basically that is um, who we are and what we plan to do. Starting for is uh, about $190,000, $190,000. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, short, precise, and uh, indeed we've got an insight of your business. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roland, Michelle, anybody? Jackie? I, I just want to make one observation, and this is uh, for everyone on the call. Uh, notice how her biggest competition 
uh, was uh, was Zam beef, and uh, and I want all of you to be thinking about whenever you have a product, uh, whenever you're pro you have a product or service that you're going to be competing with. Notice the difference in who the current winners are, how they have branded. They are good at branding. Uh, they were very mm -hmm. careful with what they named it. Uh, like Zam beef, that's a that's a catchy name, and it doesn't matter who the person is mm -hmm. behind it because the brand is bigger than the person, uh, which makes the business easier to sell. It makes the it more memorable as well. People will be more likely to remember, uh, you know, they will be asking when they buy beef at the marketplace, is this Zam beef? Or, you know, if you have a long business name and it's your name and it, other kind of things. Uh, so don't just think about what sounds good for a name for you. Think about what name, what brand will do well in the marketplace. Two different ways of thinking, but that'll be very helpful uh, for you to create a sticky brand, especially if you're looking at moving outside of your district, uh, much less uh, outside of the country or internationally. Thank you, though, Lisa. Very good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, what I did here, Nyakan yes. and, and Dr. Roland, I, I I didn't hear how much uh, Lisa and uh, her co-partner are asking for. Um, in terms of uh, funding, I think that would be helpful. And and then also, um, uh, ask you. Please go ahead. Oh, the amount asking for is hundred and ninety thousand dollars. That will be for the equipment and um, the the buildings. Um, uh, advertising um, and packaging. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. I just wanted to go back to to Chamar as well, who spoke about mining, um, sulfuric acid, and all. And just to indicate that uh, I think for Zambia, we know that mining does employ a lot, but like he had said, the license from Zema is is cardinal. Um, Apart just from that, I think we have seen uh, mining firms uh, operate in Zambia and leave and make promises and sign agreements with the chiefs on their corporate social responsibility. Um, I think maybe for Chama and his team, I would like to, to just um, emphasize to them that instead of you really thinking of your corporate social responsibility, start looking at it as corporate social investments. So, and when you sign with the chiefs, just stick to that especially that you are, you are Zambian as well, and I'm sure you have the interest of your people at heart, um, so that it's not one of these mines that we've seen uh, some locals partnered with. Foreign investors, they promised the chiefs, they promised the local people that they'll develop the areas, but we see a lot of resource being taken out and the areas are not developed. So I think one of the things you need to understand that under the Timeless platform, we are very um, particular about even our environment as well and our human resource in Africa and the people. If we go and mine in an area, there has to be investment in that area and the area has to grow and the local people have to develop. Otherwise, I think that mining project is a very good project for Zambia as well, the DRC and part of the central southern region. For the pig rearing Kafua district, a district I understand very well because I've worked in that district uh, for so long and also um, I did go to school. Food processing in, in Kafue is at a very uh, small rate, very, very small scale. So um, for Lisa and, and her team, if they, they really could put in all the effort and when the funding comes, um, you know, just remain very focused, they could actually tap that niche very well. They could tap that, that niche because then it takes them to the southern part of the country as well, where they could even uh, have outgrowers for pigs and have all these, you know, local small farmers grow the pigs for you because you're going into processing and then you buy from them and process add on to what you're rearing. I think a similar model that Zambif has been using as well. But since you've picked this one particular district, it's very good because you can actually um, you know, uh, perfect your, your processing, your pig processing uh, factory and do well. And remember that 
Kafua district is growing at a very fast rate. And, and now that the council has given out more land to the people, we're going to see more housing probably coming up in there, uh, a few industries going up in there. So you really do have the market and you have the nearby towns that you can support. And because of the Kafua River, you have restaurants and a few tourist resorts there that you could supply your food products to. Thank you very much. Yeah, very useful, Jackie, very useful. And, um, you know, for all the entrepreneurs and project owners on the call, as we are giving feedback, as we are, you know, giving feedback for each enterprise, take, take that advice, you know, branding, you know, while, while, while we, you had, you know, Dr. Roland sharing some insights on branding uh, to, to, to Lisa, it, it applies to all of you, you know, think about it. When you're, when you're looking at, you know, positioning, you're looking at statistics of growth in, in the districts that you're, you're investing your projects. You've just had Jackie giving feedback again to Lisa on Kafue district and, and what's going on in that district. It's fast growing. Think about it as well in the districts that you're deploying your projects. What's going on there? What are the opportunities? Well, how can you position yourself in that place so that you're getting value throughout this call, even though you're not the one who, who is speaking. Um, thank you so much for that. So next on my screen is Blackwell. Blackwell Chalway, um, try and make it very efficient uh, and, and short so that we, we can have as many people speak in the remaining 30 minutes of intros, okay? Uh, Blackwell. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Blackwell Chalway. Uh, I'm with Trend uh, Economist and uh, I have a master's in uh, supply chain management and procurement and also another master's in executive MBA in leadership and wealth creation. So I'm very passionate about uh, wealth creation in this country. And uh, my project is about uh, integrating uh, poultry, uh, farming and piggery as well. So we chose uh, Northwestern province, to be particular, Solwezi. So Solwezi, uh, we have already acquired, uh, we have already agreed with the chief and just committed uh, about 1,500 1, hectares of land where we can uh, put uh, the project. So we're looking at doing poultry at a larger scale. So our business will be done in four phases. So the first phase will be the poultry, which will be the layers and the broilers. So we're looking at uh, producing over uh, about 35,000 eggs a day and also about uh, 100,000 uh, of chickens a month. What uh, motivated us is when we went to Solwezim or a supermarket and we found that uh, there was shortage of eggs, then that also clicked and uh, helped us to also venture in this. Uh, my partners are also have vast experience in uh, farming and poultry. And uh, I also have a uh, passionate about uh, poultry business. So uh, why in Northwestern province? So we have noticed that uh, the market is huge. Uh, that's the home of uh, mining now, where we have about uh, four uh, big mines like Kalundira, Lomana, Kansashi mine, and uh, 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 mine mine that they are yeah. open. Then uh, in addition to, we have also, uh, Solozi shares a border with, you know, so shares the border with Angola and uh, and Congo, which also offer a large opportunity for business. Because uh, you, you agree with me that when you go to that border, it's very rare that you come back with uh, the products that you're selling. So the market is huge. And uh, it uh, also help uh, in uplifting the locals in that uh, province, because we're looking at uh, creating uh, about uh, 300 job, permanent jobs in the four state plan, and then we also create about uh, 500 indirect jobs. Uh, so, our main competitors are Zambiv and Hybrid, and we also aim to do the value addition on the products. When we talk of value addition, we are looking at uh, uh, chicken, we are looking at uh, selling the pieces or even uh, the food chicken as well. So in the near future, we may also venture in uh, uh, value addition in, uh, pig, pigs, which is uh, uh, selling of uh, smoked pigs or pork, 
and uh, bacon. So we are looking at uh, the investment of uh, about five million dollars to set up the plant, uh, acquiring of all the equipment and uh, the operation cost as well. What's up? Thank you so much, Blackwell. That was um, um, efficient and precise. Um, I just have a, f a few questions. One, one sure. mainly. Um, you said you acquired the, you know, permit from the chief. You know, they've offered to give 150 hectares. Yeah. 1,500 hectares. 1,500 acres. Okay. Hectares. Yes. How stable do you think that agreement is in terms of long-term planning? You know, how will political factors and leadership factors? Because sometimes these decisions are made and, and based on who's the leader at the time. Maybe the next leader, you know, community interests, political interests, how safe and sustainable is that decision and, and that land tenure? Well, uh, it's very stable. And uh, after, uh, according to Chief, once we get the investors, we'll be able to sign uh, an agreement and they'll be able to process the title that will be under the company name. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it will be under the company. So are they giving ownership to the to your company? Yes, we'll give ownership to the company. Oh, okay. In, in, in return for what? In uh, all they want is us to create employment and also uplift the standards of the locals. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, Dr. Roland? The chief is, also, the chief is, uh, is one of those uh, learned chiefs with a PhD. So he is also keen in uh, seeing that there's a uh, worth creation in his chief job. Mm. Okay. I have one question, Blackwell. From the sure. time you receive funding, when are you going to be, how soon can you generate revenue? Uh, so from the time we receive, uh, we are looking at uh, probably to set uh, having the returns in uh, the first year. And uh, the business will become, uh, will be able to break even in the first year. The second year we start now generating, a, we start making profit. I don't know if I've answered your question, Doctor. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Blackwell. Uh, next on my screen is Love More. Love More. Are you ready, Love More? So maybe we move to Ingrid as Lavmo prepares. Ingrid, you're next on my screen. <laughs> Ingrid, hi. Uh, hello, hello. Good, good morning. Good morning. Can we go ahead? Or oh, Ingrid is coming on. Okay, Lavmo, you can go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, my name is Tendai Matenga. As, uh, um, as um, the executive summary was introduced, we're using LoveMo's computer. That's why it's showing LoveMo. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay. Um, so basically, um, um, I am uh, from the medical profession. I'm a dental practitioner in my own right. I'm running a dental clinic um, in Chilanga area in Lusaka. Um, uh, our company uh, that we're using is called Sparkle Smile Solution, and we are looking at um, poultry. Uh, 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 we are, our, our interest is, is packaging and poultry for this company. Um, the founders for the company is myself and my elder sister, who's uh, uh, an agri specialist. She's with the University of Zambia. Um, Love More is our research uh, uh, and development fellow who, who basically has been in the poultry industry for a long time and is the one who's, who's been helping us with the poultry and how we've uh, uh, agreed to, to start a business in packaging uh, and poultry. So at the moment, our company is looking at um, uh, setting up a packaging station here in Zambia where we, we entice uh, uh, small scale farmers and, and big, big scale, basically poultry farmers to bring um, 
eggs to us where we do the, the packaging and then we, we basically um, uh, involve uh, a retailer. So basically ours is a simple model of, of packaging. Uh, uh, I will uh, uh, involve Love more to, to talk about uh, most, uh, <coughs> most the technicalities of, of the whole um, idea. But basically that's what we're looking at. Um, we are looking at funding. We're, we are looking at a funder. Okay. And how much and funding? Love more. Hello. Hello. Um, what we're looking at, we're looking at a parking station. <clears throat> I'll give you a background of what the poultry industry has been in Zambia. Poultry industry in Zambia has been an industry which can grow by, let's say, 50% in three years and can crash uh, to by 30% within a month. Reason being that, you know, the, um, the processing, and uh, availability of raw materials for feed. Sometimes, you know, when there's bad weather, then the feed just goes up, farmers are unable to, to, to manage. Most chain uh, stores, they require consistency and quantity. And most farmers who are small cannot be able to supply to chain stores. So what we need is, we need somebody, we need a packing station which will, will, will collect the eggs from the rest of the small farmers, package them properly, uh, uh, check for any cracks, any defects, and anything like that. And then these eggs now can be supplied to the chain stores who have consistency and quality, and that eggs will be sorted in their different sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, et cetera, et cetera. Unlike the way it is right now, eggs are just supplied. It's, you know, it's like uh, one man for himself and God for us all. So when the weather is bad, the crops are bad, then there's no supply of, uh, especially for small-scale farmers. They won't be able to supply to, to chain stores. So at the end of the day, what happens is that when this happens, when the feed goes so high, a lot of farmers end up stopping uh, doing their poultry business because they cannot afford the price of eggs and be able to find the right market for their products. So uh, there's no one who's, who's got a parking station right now in Zambia. So we're trying to put up a parking station here in Osaka, which will be able to encourage farmers to concentrate on production rather than be the judge, the juror, and the executioner. Then the packing station will be able to pack the eggs properly and be able to supply to chain stores. That's yes. basically the, the model. Yes. So the packing station will have transport, which will collect eggs from all the farmers that are part of the... You're asking something? Uh, yes, how much funding are you looking for? How much funding are you looking for? We're looking for around $5 million. We're looking for $5 million. And is that to build the packing station? Yes, it, that, that will, for the infrastructure, the, the machinery for, for the packing station and transportation to collect and deliveries. Okay. You know, I really like the business. Um, it's obviously pre-revenue uh, because it's not being done now. Uh, but let me tell you the principle why I like the idea, and then I'm going to give you a practical next step that I that I would like to see you take uh, as soon as possible. Uh, first, in the days uh, of the gold rush uh, in America, when they were everyone only lived on the east coast of the United States, and they were expanding west. You know, before there was a California, before there was Texas. And so they were moving out because they heard there was gold there and all kinds of people went to try to, you know, find gold and become rich and things like that. But the people who really created wealth during that time was not the gold miners. It was the people selling the picks and the shovels, <laughs> all right, to the miners. And what I see you all doing yeah. <laughs> is, 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 yes. is not, it, you're focusing on one element of the supply chain which is the pivotal section of it because a lot of people can have, whether it's one pig or one chicken or a thousand pigs and a thousand chickens, uh, you're bridging that gap, especially for small farmers who, who won't be able to package and process. Um, but to, but here's, the, here's the interesting thing. You're gonna be focused on small scale farmers, uh, but yet the plant that you're trying to start out with uh, is a very large uh, you know, scale production. 
So my, chat, my, my encouragement and recommendation to you is to think about where you should start and then maybe have the $5 million you know, large processing plant be a phase two or phase three as your business grows because you can start with your own vehicle to go to pick up uh, from, from local farmers and you can do much of these kind of things uh, in a very small place uh, and uh, at least set up the infrastructure and the supply chain. And then as you have that, because that takes very little capital, that takes effort, uh, it takes discipline, it takes consistency, and it takes a brand. But once you have those things established, uh, then it's easier to see yep. that, a, that the investment would be safe uh, and that it's not too big for serving too small of, of, of farmers. And you'll actually learn what the plant should look like. Uh, right now, you don't really, you, you have an idea of how to set one up, but what you, what we cannot know until you serve yep. these small farmers. I do is what that process will look like. So yeah, I love it. I love the space. Uh, please continue down this path and uh, look forward to seeing, you know, what your next step is. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and also- um, no, Actually, uh, if I could just uh, enlighten you on that one. If I could just enlighten you on that one. Uh, last year, I visited the, the Netherlands just to go out and look at this process. Hello? Yes, we're listening. Yes. Please proceed. Am I still on? Yes, you yeah, are. Am I still on? Yes. I visited the Netherlands, so I have looked at the process and the kind of equipment that is required. So I've done some research on that. Very good. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that I've done some research on that. I was in the Netherlands last year and uh, looked at the kind of equipment that is required. Uh, I was invited by a company called Pume. Mm -hmm. Now that's good, Lavmo. I think um, what, what we're trying to do yeah. is give you insights of Thanks. things you think about. We're giving you insights of things to think about, even as you're moving in the direction that you're moving, yeah? So that you can move right. to the point that you scale optimally, right? For example, what location have you chosen? Thanks a Plant, isn't it? How, how many districts can it, can that plant have? Yeah. I think Jennifer wants All to right. the screen. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to add on the Sorry. Um, Hello. Hi, Nyakan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Okay, I wanted to say, I wanted to just add on a bit on, um, on Love Moore's um, uh, business and to indicate to Dr. Roland and yourself, Nya Khan, that packaging um, in Zambia is a huge challenge. And uh, most of our farm produce uh, packaging is coming from, from South Africa. And because of that, it's expensive. So the industry they are going in, um, I know that we, we probably have maybe two or three other companies that are packaging and these are um, owned by the Asians, but uh, most of their packaging, I think for them has not even streamlined into agriculture produce. They're more into the cosmetics, uh, the detergents and all. But truly speaking, um, they have a very um, unique and very profitable um, business idea and venture going forward because our farmers, even at our markets, I mean, it's different when you even just travel across into South Africa and you look at the packaging of farm produce, even in the supermarket, it's so well done. We still have that challenge at a small scale, at a medium scale, and sometimes even at a large scale. And, and even to export our farm produce, you find that a lot of farmers, small scale farmers are failing to export from one province into another. This is within Zambia. Just to export, if I'm growing, for instance, mangoes from Wapula province, where there's lots of mango, it's a mango, mango province. It's so hard for me to package that mango very well and bring it into Lusaka in a clean way and without it being destroyed. So if their factory um, comes into um, effect and or, you know, starts operating, I think that, and I know, 
that they will really take over the market and a lot of farmers will be ready to work with them. Um, you know, just something to really think through because they don't have much competition at their scale on the farm program. Thank you, Jackie. That's very no. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. That's very useful. Um, and I think one of the things I was trying to bring out earlier was, um, you know, uh, love more as you're thinking about setting up the plant in the district that you've chosen, you know, how far can, the, can, can, can you engage? You know, how, how far is your market? How, how far the farmers that that plant can serve, you know? Because you get $5 million, you know, to put up that particular plant, you know, how far wide, how many districts can that plant serve? Just think about, you know, some of those uh, dynamics, you know, um, in terms of like sure, meeting that sure, demand. Sure. Okay. So yeah, next yeah. on my screen, we have Ingrid. Ingrid, go ahead. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, my name is Ingrid Kunda from Lusaka, Zambia. Um, my company name is called Rediv Media. We trade as Rediv Media. We are Rediv Enterprises, Zambia Limited, registered in 2016. Uh, my partners and I started this business after uh, we lost our former job to the biggest newspaper then in Zambia. And um, after that, we went into a business ca uh, called Redeem Media. Our company, what the company does is we are an advertising agency, 360 advertising agency, as well as uh, printing and branding. So for my uh, request for finances for this particular time, uh, we were requesting for, um, to be funded for a printing machine, a large format printer. So um, in the past three years, we've been in existence. Uh, we've lost uh, business uh, close to about $300,000. Just this uh, COVID period between March and uh, today, we lost uh, business uh, worth uh, $62,000, mainly because uh, we do have the connections, we do have the clients, but we outprice ourselves because we don't have an in-house printer. So because we're going to outsource, we always end up being very, very expensive. So um, we're a uh, going concern, very uh, successful business in the three years that we've existed. Um, with uh, uh, income uh, this year, we had actually made, uh, we're projecting an income of uh, close to a million uh, dollars. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, because of the unforeseen uh, circumstances of the COVID-19 that has uh, affected all of the businesses in the world. So uh, basically, um, we are requesting if we could, uh, uh, begins, be given some funds um, to, to, to buy a large format printer. Uh, we expect to start making money immediately. In the third or fourth month, we should be able to even break even because the demand that we have uh, is quite high. But unfortunately, we're not able to meet our demand because we are outsourcing. The, the clients that we have, we have uh, um, Oh, one of uh, um, a Walmart group of companies who's one of our clients here in Zambia and they do a lot of printing. We have to outsource and we're really, really expensive. So um, basically in a nutshell, that's what we're looking for. We're currently looking for 150,000 US dollars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Um, very deep, short and precise. Um, and congratulations, um, you know, for the work that you're doing in your sector. Um, any initial thoughts uh, and, and, and others? Michelle, any initial thoughts? No, great business, and you gave me all the information I need, current size, scope, stability with the clients, and the amount of funding. And I, I, I think the amount of funding that you're looking for is exactly in line for the size of business that you are. And uh, I, th I think it's a great business. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh -huh. strong, strong offer. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, next on my screen, so you're welcome. N next on my screen is Rowena. Rowena. Fungai. Hello, my name is Rowena. It's written as Rowena, but it's pronounced as Rowena. Okay. Um, yes, uh, so we have uh, an, a, a company, and our company name is called uh, Renobacho Ingenuity. 
uh, Renovatio Ingenuity has got uh, two lines of business. One is IT related, and then the other is uh, food and beverage. The food and beverage part, uh, the business name was uh, incorporated in September last year. And um, that uh, the, the business itself, it comes from where, on my part, um, I've been um, more, I've been doing a lot of uh, home, uh, home baking, home foods and so forth from the time I was actually very young. So what we've done is that we said, look, instead of us just focusing on one line, which is on the IT side, where we are working with my husband, we then said, no, let's also incorporate that which you have a heart for, and then we bring in the food and beverage part. So that's where the food and beverage comes in. Um, in our, we, we made two project proposals. Uh, one is for a um, water bottling company, and then the other is for a bakery and bakery supplies. Um, so with the water bottling, uh, right now we know that in terms of the market, uh, the market, we've got a number of players. Uh, however, the main thing is how we position ourselves and how we differentiate ourselves from the rest. Our focus is obviously to look at the different, um, um, for example, our focus is in terms of positioning. Uh, right now, we, we're based in uh, New Kasama, and within the area, we do not have any suppliers within the area. Most of the distribution that is done is actually done from bakery. Yeah. We're looking at issues of bread, and then also we are looking at also helping out the other bakeries, the other people that actually do cakes to be able to provide supplies for them because for them to have access, especially if you stay in New Kasama, they have to go all the way, uh, for example, maybe about four kilometers from town. So what we want is to bring the products close to where the consumers are, where they'll be able to get their accessories without necessarily having to go long distances. So um, when we did our, our financials, our request for the funding, it's mostly on the equipment uh, portion. So for the water bottling, we are looking at the water bottling machine itself. And on the water bottling side, we've put in a proposal for uh, $75,000. That's our request. And then for the bakery, we are looking at 22,500. So for both combined, we're talking about $97,500, which is mainly for the equipment involved. With regard to the water bottling company, we've got uh, land. And uh, in terms of us finding areas where we'll be able to station our plant, that is not a problem because we already have where that will be, will be sited. Thank you so much. So thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Rowena. Very clear, very precise. Um, you know, um, when you get the money, are you going to start with the water bottling? Are, or are you going to start with the bakery? Because, you know, it's a combined, two proposals with combined uh, cost. And then do you have the staff and the service, you know, this, you know, the people, the technical expertise, you know, to run, you know, the water bottling and, and, and the bakery? Yeah, could you just speak so to that? Okay, so when we get the, when we get the funding, uh, the first that we're going to start with is the bakery. Um, the, after the bakery, then while we work with the bakery, because um, in terms of expertise, um, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. And then um, I, I hold the master's uh, in business administration. And then uh, my husband is um, he's a technician. He's uh, as an IT specialist. So in terms of technical know-how, we have that as well. We also work with actually Rediv Media when it comes to issues of our marketing and our research. So uh, Ingrid, we, we work together at some point because we were in the same, um, in the same organization that, uh, that had issues and all that. And that's how we found ourselves here. And obviously um, they say one closed door gives rise to an open door. And it has also made us uh, given us these ideas to say, look, 
we're not just supposed to look at ourselves as being employees. We should be able to become entrepreneurs who will be able to give chance to others, employ others, as well as advance ourselves in terms of, um, of the environment where we live in and just bring in a different economic aspect to what is happening and not just sit down and cry to say, look, this has happened. What is my way forward? So when it comes to issues of, um, of stuff, uh, we right now, obviously, because we are small, we're not yet able, we're not, we haven't started employing a lot of people yet, but of course, we've already started looking at what is it that we need to do and who it is that we need to work with. Because like we indicated that uh, from the time we started doing, um, from the time we, we registered the business name for foods and beverages, we've already had uh, companies, including some of our revenue authorities, where we are able to actually do supplies of food. So when it comes to staff and people to work with, that is not a problem because we already have people that we've already identified for these positions. So that once the funding comes in, then we can be able to, to bring them in on board on a permanent basis because we don't want to bring in people and then fail to sustain them at the moment. So as it stands, we have to look at our cost to say, how are we able to manage this? Are we able to manage it by employing these people permanently now? Or should we wait as the business advances? So once we get the funding and we have everything already laid up, then we know that it's an issue of the door can off. Now we are moving you from you just from us just bringing you in on a contract basis to you now coming in on a permanent basis. Okay. All right. Have you identified customers? Do you have customers ready? Yes, especially for the bread. Yes, we have. Mm. Uh, because uh, from the bakery side, the bread is the main one. Then also, um, having been um, baking for a long time in terms of doing cakes, because I do cakes of all occasions and all those things, we, we have a network. So we know each other and we know that these are the challenges that my friends are facing. If I need a cake box, I have to go all the way uh, four kilometers for me to go and get. So I know already to say these are the clientele that I'll have within my network, because then I know that I'll be able to actually meet the needs. Thank you so much, Rowena. Um, other reactions, Dr. Roland and uh, Michelle and Jackie? No, thank you for sharing. Yeah, no. Great. Yeah, so next up on my screen is um, Belinda, Belinda Katongo. Belinda? If she if she's not ready, can Danny go next? Danny, Belinda, you're ready. Go ahead. Are you able to get me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Um. So I'm Belinda Katongo. I'm in the fashion and designing industry as well as textile. Um, I'm a registered company. Uh, my, my company name is Bellamat Fashion and Design. I've been in operation for since uh, 2017. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that I have a huge clientele where my business is concerned. I, I do tailor-made outfits, I do value addition, to clothes and um, the reason why I applied for this, uh, I'm looking for financial aid, for lack of a better term, is uh, because I love machinery. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be receiving clients from different stakeholders, one of them being the mining industry. Uh, I, I received a contract from Columbia Mines to supply PA outfits, but unfortunately, because of the lack of machinery that I have, I subcontract people to help me and finish up my work in time. And not just that, I also have um, a contract with the, with the Ministry of Education. I've been asked to, to make face masks for students as they'll be opening, but because of the same problem of machinery, I am subcontracting people to help me uh, with the work. So I did my, my research, 
trying to find out how much I should need for the machinery. And I'm, I'm hearing all those numbers being mentioned and the big projects that are being mentioned. I'm like, am I in the right place? <laughs> yeah, but um, with the research that I did, I only need 50,000 kwacha to get the right machinery that I need. I already have a working space where I, where I work from. And um, I'm glad to say I employ some few youths who have the same skill that I have of, of fashion and designing. So I, I intend to start with this and in future, looking at uh, the challenge that we have with fabrics in, in Zambia, we actually have a few textile companies I intend to open up a textile company where I'm able to produce fabrics and not just rely on imported fabrics. So for now, the only thing that I need is a machinery for me to get operating. Let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. Thank you, and uh, I love the business. Uh, okay. It's very, it's very, uh, Pardon the pun, but fashion forward. <laughs> it's forward thinking. Yes, so, thank you. Uh, great, yes, great work. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, how much revenue are you doing right yes. now? Revenue in a month, I'm able to generate 5,000 kwacha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, if I am operating everything, I'm able to generate 5,000 kwacha. But uh, because of the fact that I need to subcontract for me to get my work done, you would find that I'm actually generating more, but spending on other people. Right. And those contracts, uh, so you have contracts in place to, for supplying uh, uniforms? Yeah. For yes, I okay. yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Very good. Congratulations. Uh, you know, great business you're, you're building at Thank the rate, so rate. and, um, you know, certainly going through this process, we'll, we'll be able to help you get funded. And, and, and I do agree that that is the right next step for your business. And I also like that you're not trying to overhaul and, you know, your entire business in one, you know, funding element, but that you're, you're taking the next yep. logical step in your business and investors look for yeah, exactly. people who are logical and taking the next logical step. They don't like going from zero to 100. They like going, you know, they want to see that incremental improvement. In fact, a lot of times investors uh, on larger amounts, let's say somebody wants uh, $500,000, a lot of times investors uh, won't yeah. get 500,000. They'll say, I'll give you 100,000 yeah. for you to do this. And then once you yes. accomplish that milestone, I'll give you another 100,000 for you to go to the next milestone. Uh, so a lot of them don't like to write yes. one big check anyway. Uh, so I, I, the way you're doing it, I think it's set up uh, for success. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. I'm grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Belinda. And thanks for the confidence that you're displaying despite, you know, questioning yourself, you know, <laughs> thank you. remember we are all at different stages. We all, and let's not try to be somebody else. Let's do what works for us. Okay. And let's restore uh, there are people who are far ahead in their in their in their stage and the people who are just beginning and that's all okay. There is something for everybody. Okay. So and, so and I, maybe yeah. maybe I need to have Belinda make me a custom outfit for when I'm in Zambia in August. Exactly. How about that? You know? I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> yeah, I would yeah. love to. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Just, uh, you, you can, can I come in a little? Yes, absolutely. Okay, sure. Um, I think congratulations to the entrepreneurs that have spoken so far. Um, again, I just wanted to emphasize for, for, you know, for the sake of uh, Dr. Roland as well. I know he's done great research already around Africa and probably Zambia, Nyakwan and the rest of our colleagues out there. The, the, the poultry business in Zambia is, uh, is another industry where um, at a large scale, um, a lot of profits uh, are made and um, we've seen a lot of exports, again, going into the Congo and into Angola. So the Zambian market still has a shortage 
of poetry. Nobody can actually know, and the, even Zambia will tell you that they're not meeting the demand um, within Zambia itself. And also because they're concentrating on, uh, sometimes on exports into the DRC and into Angola, uh, where of course they're paying a premium there because of you know, our, our colleagues' uh, economies. So that's another one. Um, the bakery industry, um, initially we had seen a number of chain stores out of South Africa um, have bakeries in the supermarkets. Uh, but because of COVID and the economic situation, we've seen most of these, some of these chain stores closing down and going back. So a gap has been created for Zambians to fill that gap. And I'll tell you that there are areas still in this country where you will go to and they do not have a bakery. And, and, and there's, there, there, there's small um, townships that we have even in the city that lack a bakery. And bread is highly consumed, especially in the urban setting in Zambia. Bread, scones, and what we call buns, uh, sweet buns as well. It's, it's a huge market because then you'll find a lot of women and the youth will go to a bakery and negotiate wholesale prices. And once they purchase that, they'll go back in the townships and they'll sell for a little profit to sustain their households. So it's a big gap. Printing um, and branding, again, uh, Zambians are finding their space in that on a large scale. Um, and also because in, in the beginning, we, we had um, organizations um, like, um, I think Ingrid had said, even Hallmark itself, all the printing was being done out of South Africa. But I think with movements now and bringing in paper, printed paper can be tedious. Everybody wants to print locally. Branding in the mining sector, uniforms, uniforms for schools, government has emphasized and continues to, to pass policy that Zambian fashion designers and tailors should be supported. So now we're seeing um, large mining uh, corporations, conglomerates, even the private sector in general, the banks, asking that Zambians are the ones that tailor their uniforms that design whatever um, uh, garments that they want at a large scale. Um, so a bit of that call from government, um, then through the Zambia Development Agency, um, you can see that uh, opportunities are opening for Zambians to find a market for, for most of their work. Yes, um, I just wanted to highlight on that. Uh, the president keeps hitting on a daily basis. Please support local, support local. With COVID now, you'll be amazed that we actually even had a shortage of onions in the country because 90% of our onions were coming from South Africa. So now the local farmers, uh, small scale, medium, large scale, people have gone flat out to grow a lot of onions. So there's great opportunity. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Jacqueline. I think, uh, you know, it's really good to have um, you continuously um, shedding light on, on, on the perspective and context um, of, of Zambia and the opportunities that, that exist for all of us. Thank you. That is so, so useful. Um, yeah, so next I would love to, to have Danny. Is Danny ready? And then after Danny, we have Henry. Henry Firi. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Firi Henry. Uh, I'm in the hospitality sector. Um, maybe before I speak about the business, just to give you a little bit of uh, background about myself. Um, I have worked, I was working for the Zambia Revenue Authority which is a tax administration authority in the country. I worked there for 24 years uh, until July last year. Whilst I was in employment, I was uh, developing um, eight units, uh, eight serviced apartment units. Um, this year, I incorporated a company called HP and Associates. I have since transferred that property into the name of HP and Associates. The, 
the objective of the, or probably the, Just a moment, I'm just trying to organize something. Yeah, like I said, we I have a property in Ililai where I had started developing eight units of um, serviced apartments. And then uh, this year I incorporated a company called HP and Associates, uh, which aims to provide uh, the apartments in the Lusaka for short and long-term tenants and business patrons. Um, we, sorry, I, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> can, uh, can you just give me some time? No, don't worry about it. You know, um, it's, it's a natural process. Yeah. Can, can I ask a couple questions, Henry? Uh, yes, yeah. please. Let's do it that way. Uh, because I love real estate. Um, I actually started off when I was 18 in real estate, uh, when I was a freshman mm -hmm. in college. I didn't have a penny to my name, uh, kind of grew up that way, uh, but, I worked, but I was taught hard work and good values, got to college and um, got a, a job that paid me a few dollars an hour uh, and thought I was rich. <laughs> and, uh, and so I started learning how to invest that and I started in real estate and buying units after unit and ended up with several million in real estate uh, just uh, before I graduated college. And so I, I love real estate. Uh, that's how I got my start. Uh, so I would ask, uh, so you have right now, do you have eight units on your property or do you just have the land? No, no, no. I actually have constructed about um, 60 to 65% of the, the units. Okay, and, and uh, are any of those rented out? No, not yet. They are not uh, they are not complete yet so okay. actually the funding that that we seek now is for the completion of the eight um, uh, units okay and how much are you looking for uh in our executive summary unfortunately there was a typo we put 250,000 us but actually we're looking for 300,000 us okay. uh, and what do those what does each unit rent out for what are you going to rent each unit for? Or, yeah. Uh, we, the, our model is to do um, 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 80,000, sorry, 80, 80 US dollars per night sharing. The, each apartment has got three bedrooms. Okay, so that's per bedroom, $80. No, 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 for the whole unit. For the, for the whole unit. The whole unit to who fetch for eighty dollars per night. Okay. Yes. Uh each unit. Uh okay, and then they have three bedrooms. Okay. Uh so you're really looking for real estate financing, uh construction financing, really. Uh yes. Uh, uh, part of it will go to the construction. And but my 80% um, of that will probably go for will go for fitting equipment, furniture, and uh, working capsule. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your business. Yeah. yeah thank you. And and the reason we we're doing this kind of call is so that you get comfortable, you know, um, and and get used to this kind of uh, engagement. You know, just be relaxed and uh, and you know, investors are people. You know, we keep saying they're human beings and they want to invest. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So thank, thank you so you. much thank for you. sharing the business, um, Henry. Next, we can go to, um, who's next on my screen? Bridget, Bridget. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bridget Moya. Uh, I'm operating under a company called He Said Holdings. Uh, it's uh, first time, it's starting up, and uh, the only thing I have is land, land that is along a, a river or a stream. And uh, 
we made two proposals uh, in the company. The, we registered HISEC company in 2017, and uh, we are, I'm the founder together with my sister Prudence Moya and uh, Mr. Billy Sikazwe. Our background is that we are all teachers. Uh, here in Zambia, government is uh, promoting that even as you work, you can have a side project. So I have acquired land, and on this land, I would like to do poultry and uh, gardening because it's along a stream. And specifically, I would like to go into growing tomatoes. Uh, so for, for that particular uh, project, uh, we were asking for 50,000 US dollars. And then uh, the second one we submitted was on microfinancing. Uh, this particular one, we, we, we kind of just identified a gap uh, uh, in financing, particularly to workers that are working in chain stores. Uh, government seems to have um, a memorandum of understanding with uh, the banks so that uh, government workers are able to get loans from the bank. Uh, but it's not the same for people working for chain stores or small uh, companies. So uh, we were thinking we could come up with a microfinancing company that could kind of cater for these people to also enable them get startup uh, uh, funds to do one or two things for themselves. And for this particular project, we were asking for 75,000 US dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, my feedback real quick, microfinance is a very interesting business. Uh, I do like it, but I can tell you that the success or failure depends on the people involved in that because especially if they have banking uh, history where they have evaluated numerous projects and deals and know how to assess risk, that's really the key uh, in, in being sustainable and viable in the, in the microfinance space especially. Uh, and then on the uh, poultry, it does sound like you have a lovely piece of land and a great place to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, I would also suggest, um, as I did to one other uh, startup a company, that you start, uh, very, start small with what you have. You don't need financing to buy one, uh, two, five chickens. Uh, and uh, that way you can start your, your poultry uh, business uh, with the land that you currently have. And uh, same thing with a garden. Uh, you know, uh, you can start a garden for, for uh, just a few dollars. It's a lot of sweat and a lot of uh, hard work and effort, but you can at least get some of those things started. So then your story uh, is not, I need to be able to start, whenever there are some very basic and easy steps that you can take right now uh, to actually start. Then you're not trying to look for startup capital, you are looking for growth capital. And there's a big difference in investors' minds, uh, which one they're, they want to invest in. So. Just a few thoughts, but uh, you know, it sounds like you're on headed the right direction, especially with what Jackie has shared with uh, the poultry and with the, the the piece of land, a strategic piece of land that you already have. Thank you. Yeah, well done, Bridget. Looking forward to to you know you continuing to build on that process. Uh, next on my screen, really quick, we have Chanda and then um, Molenga. Molenga, prepare after Chanda. Chanda. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. My name is Chanda um, and my company name is um, Prestige Link. Um, and I am into education and training. Um, so uh, basically my business is um, to offer, to start up an entrepreneurial training institute, so to say. Um, to start helping entrepreneurs um, in different phases. So um, to start their business, um, then to improve their business um, or to scale up their business and then to expand their business as well, um, but also offer um, other services such as coaching, mentoring, um, leadership training, uh, public speaking, networking, and that sort of thing. Um, so mainly basically central to the learning process 
um, will be to teach entrepreneurs um, a variety of skills. Um, some of the topics that we would be looking at would be um, legal requirements to start your business, such as registration, um, taxing, banking, um, doing things like um, uh, business proposals, writing business proposals, writing business plans, um, and then looking at uh, integral parts of the business, so things like marketing, staffing, um, financial management, um, cash flow plans, profit plans, um, projection, record keeping, um, but also when we're looking at the other areas um, to get the business investor ready, so business pitching to investors, to clients, to management, um, and then of course, as I said, the coaching, the mentoring, um, and the leadership, um, basically in a nutshell, I hope that makes sense. It does. Thank you, Shonda. Question. Um, how much funding are you seeking? Um, around $40,000. Okay. And what will that go to? So that's cause I'm, I'm just starting. So I've only done, um, two trainings this year. Um, and then COVID kicked in. So we want to make it face-to-face um, -face trainings, but also we want to do a lot of virtual trainings as well. So we can do trainings um, uh, via internet, um, Zoom, and not just in Lusaka because there seems to be a demand um, outside as well, um, but also to do specialist trainings. So if we bring in somebody who is going to do training for farmers, tomato growing, or um, animal husbandry, um, so specialist trainings as well. So it's going to go to um, really purchase of equipment and uh, starting up. The okay, let me give a few thoughts here. Uh, there are uh, great e-learning platforms that you'll be able to use uh, that don't that are not just for video live streams, but also where you can create courses. Uh, and charge, you know, even if it's like $10 per course, uh, $15. Uh, okay. and, and so you can set that up. That's very scalable. It's also very cheap. Uh, and you can also, I love that you're going to do affiliate specialist training. I actually think that that's probably a much stronger source of revenue than your own coaching uh, and your own leadership training, only because as it relates uh, globally, there's a, there is a saturation of you know, business coaches and leadership training and, and, and people are starting to get desensitized uh, a little bit to that. Uh, so everyone wants to know, well, why you, why you? And uh, so everyone tries to outdo mm -hmm. each other on credentials or, you know, uh, but, but that's why the affiliate specialist training is so critical, uh, letting other people, mm -hmm. and then if, and then do a revenue share. If you're, if they charge 20, you can charge $20, I say, you know, I have so in your, your affiliate do record a training on how to start a poultry business. You put that on your platform mm -hmm. charging $20 and uh, you get $10 and the uh, teacher, you know, the, the poultry teacher gets $10. Yeah. Uh, so you can have a revenue yeah. share model uh, that I think will help. Uh, but once again, I think these, there are a lot of things that uh, along these lines you can do at very low cost to, to, uh, to be doing that. I think really, the biggest challenge and the biggest expense that most people in this uh, line of work have uh, is their own personal finances. It's funding their own expenses, not so much the business expenses because they are much of the, the, the business. But I'd like to see you move let more, uh, move away from just the business revenue depending on you and more on the automation side mm -hmm. of other people's teaching and training. And one final thought, uh, and it's exactly what you said, uh, you basically are wanting to create an incubator and an, a, an accelerator. Uh, so an incubator helping businesses start and an accelerating help is helping existing businesses grow. And if you do that, once mm -hmm. again, um, companies in both of those categories, oftentimes do not have money to pay for consultants. And so they try to trade in kind or the better option is to uh, work on a revenue share basis. Because if, if you are worth your salt as a business coach, then you're going to grow their business and there is no harm if you're confident in your abilities and your method uh, to say, I want a, a piece of actual sales from that, uh, on new growth that, that, uh, that we help you achieve. 
So just, those are just a few thoughts on the business. I think you're looking for, um, you know, I do think that there is some, you know, some funding that may help. But as it relates to equipment, I think I would get more specific on how, uh, how that 40000 would be invested because most investors would, would quickly hear that and see, you know, that uh, really that can be done for a whole lot less money. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank, though. You. thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, just like we said, also the service industry this time, you know, is some of the better areas to go with for entrepreneurs. You know, the, you know, it's low capital intensive and, and high, high, high return. Yeah. Um, next Hi. on. Jackie. Hi, Nakan. Can I come in quickly? Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll just go a little bit back on the real estate and then I'll pick on Chanda as well. So um, we, we, we here in Zambia have a deficit of bed space um, in, the, in the real estate sector. So housing, we're sitting at a deficit of between three to five million deficit in housing and mostly low cost. And, and because that niche has not been tapped into, we see ourselves with a lot of um, shanties, mushrooming and uh, no proper water or hygiene and sanitation. Then of course, we now have uh, the service department uh, also deficit in that area. We, we have a lot of um, um, experts coming in under the UN, the World Bank and many other organizations now and because of the Congo also developing its mining sector and manufacturing and our mining sector in the Northwestern province and the Copper Belt, we, we see a lot of um, experts, foreign experts coming in, but lacking bed space. So in the area of uh, construction and particularly furnished apartments, um, we still have a huge market. Uh, we have seen that a number of South African uh, organizations have come in, probably set up a franchise. We have CIF here, we have farm building, but of course they, they cut them more for the South African market and their pricing can be very high. So we have a gap that Zambian construction, property developers and entrepreneurs can fill in, come up with uh, serviced apartments that are in areas near uh, the operations of these experts and still make their money. And, and I think the idea is mostly to start small, uh, smaller units and keep upscaling as you go along. The Chinese are trying that as well, but they're also just particularly looking at their people so much. So you find a few apartments that are serviced and owned by the Chinese, cut are mostly for their Chinese market or the Asian market. But generally for Zambia, we have um, a huge gap in that sector. When we come to consultancy like Chanda wants to do it, I think Chanda, we can give you also a lot of support from the local office. Um, if you have time, you could come and um, just sit with myself and one other colleague so that we discuss around what you want to develop for, for the Zambian market, probably, and then eventually look at the bigger picture of funding, even like Dr. Roland has said. But I think there, there are a lot of other avenues that you know, we can work through especially on how you develop your trainings, your manuals, how you package your consultancy and who it's tailored to um, especially. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Jackie, I'll do that. Thank you so much, um, Jackie and Chanda. Yeah, um, Jackie, just uh, checking in. We've got about, uh, just doing time check, we've got about maybe 10 to, to 15 enterprises, you know, in fact, a little bit more maybe, and, and, and with time constraints. I don't know, Jackie, what your thoughts are in terms of like um, intros, even as we move along. Um, yeah, just, just taking a time check. In the know, meantime- uh, are, are, we able to, uh, are we able to extend for another maybe 30 minutes, Dr. Roland and Yunya can okay with that? Because I know on the side chat, I've been having um, queries privately. Everybody's saying, I'm not leaving until I speak. So, <laughs> so I know already that we have entrepreneurs that don't want to go. So is that okay? Is that fine? Yeah, yeah. so let's, let's try a lot and be very fair. Because uh, the objective of the call 
beyond the intros is to literally um, pass it on also to the technical team to give reviews of the whole process that has taken place so far and to right. give um, the of the next steps. And we don't want to miss on that because immediately after we have another country coming on, we may not have leeway on that, but we can extend um, you know, the time for Zambia for another, Dr. Roland, maybe another 30 to 40 minutes max, could we? Thank you very much, thank you. Dr. Roland, is that, is that okay with you? Yes, that will be fine, thank you. Okay, super. But what I'd like to encourage us, because you know, I, I know what, it, what the others were not speaking could be feeling, you know, um, you know, I need to speak. So let's try and give each other a chance. Make your intro as brief as possible and as clear and concise you know, your name, your company, the sector, how much funding you're looking for, where, what the opportunities you see in your sector, so that we can quickly respond and, and give other people a chance. No, I mean, all the ideas are so rich and so exciting. I mean, I, you know, I, I get it, I get it. Yeah, but let's try and get as many people along, along with us, okay? So next um, on, my, on my screen is, um, let me see, is Grace not in Japan, Grace. I thought you said Mulenga was, was needed to be ready. I don't see them anymore, but are they ready? Mulenga, are you I'm ready? Here. I'm here. Oh, Can you Grace get me? Is, Grace is ready. Oh, my God. Let's listen to, to um, um, the other lady and then Grace come on. Okay. okay, this okay. Is... Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you get me? Yes, Mulenga. Okay. My name is Amalenga Chimba. Um, a bit of my background, I'm an accountant by profession. And while still in employment, I've been doing a side business of poultry farming. Poultry farming started just in our backyard and we've grown with time. Then we were in informal sector, but now we formally registered our company. We registered it last year in September, 2019. I am the founder and my co-founder is my son, uh, who is still in school, but we work together with great ideas that he has because his aim is to do agriculture after his grade 12. He's completing his grade 12 this year. In the poultry farming, we started as little as 200 beds, and now we've grown to 2,000 beds every cycle that we keep. We are looking for funding of 200,000 US dollars. In our plan, we have a plan to grow, um, to grow in the chickens that we'll be rearing. And also we want to venture into layers. That will be egg production. We have land where we've done a small pottery, but with the hope that if we get funding, we could go, do bigger potteries. Um, the main M is we have a lot to look at. The poultry sector is a growing sector in Zambia. And for us, working with the locals where we are set up in Chilanga is going to give employment to the local people. And also we've seen rates of malnutrition in that area. We are hoping that when we get there, we'll have a family that is able to access eggs and also chicken as a source of protein at um, a low pricing. And if we look at our plan, which has growth, is a, has a gradual growth, is that as we grow, we employ more youths and women, and that's our target. Because we know that when we have women employed in a family, malnutrition will eventually be phased out. And then in our plan, we had to set up biogases at the farm so that all the manure that comes out from the poor trees is uh, put in the biogases to create power for our workers. We are hoping that as we grow, we could house the workers. Right now, we have only housed two workers who are at the farm because we're unable to build more houses for the other workers. But we're hoping when we employ more people, we'll house them. And from the biogas, we'll be able to create our own power. That is going to reduce cost on our lighting and energy in the farming. Um, competitors in Zambia, we have big players in the poultry farming that, as you heard earlier from Jackie, that the poultry farming sector, though they may be big players, they're unable to meet the demand. 
and we know that we had we have a very wide market because right now even when our chickens are ready for market we don't take more than 24 or 48 hours to have our chickens finished by the customers we have a huge demand that we are not meeting at all for the eggs we are buying eggs right now from big commercial farmers and selling them and reselling them packaging them in smaller quantities um, which is quite a cost for us and when we do our calculations we just realize that if we have our own layers and we have our own egg production would we'll be making more money we have targeted markets of local customers uh, across districts across provinces and we also have an export market into the Congo and Angola um, in the Congo we have there's a very huge market for poultry and also into Angola there's a huge market for poultry according to our research in the poultry farming sector you should know that uh, profits that you earn from the poultry farming sector are not less than 50 percent at the most because the poultry is a very it has a very funny it has a very fun trend sometimes you get to pick in certain markets uh, certain times you drop your sales because of the weather the weather also plays a very big role so we are looking at poultry that we are going to build that we are able to control temperatures we are looking at um, machinery that we put in, in the poultry that is able to control temperatures and so that we have the same kind of uh, cells all way year round we don't have issues with the weather that uh, affecting our our products and also the weather is just uh, affecting uh, what we are going to bring to the market because sometimes according to the weather like in the cold season we've realized that the chickens that are ready are really small because of the cold and because we don't have that machinery but if we had that machinery to control our portraits it would be a different issue i have a lot to talk about but then we're looking at time as you said earlier um but in a nutshell that's all about it and our farm name is called msachi farms right now um this is me and my son who are running it and with a few workers that we've employed thank you thank you melinga thank you so much um next up grace thank you so much um my name is grace Njapa. Uh, i'm the director of kakanga food suppliers we are in uh, beekeeping and we produce honey. Um, our project started two years ago with only 50 beehives. Now, as today, we have got 200 beehives. And we are found in a, a northwestern province uh, in Mwini Lunga district and Kabompo districts, where honey is harvested. And ourselves, we are working with the women and the youth groups. Uh, women, they help us to um, uh, clean the honey and actually packaging. And our youth are the one who climbs up to put the beehives. And uh, with the honey, um, we have found that most people now, they, they, they are trying to uh, I, to to go into hand eating because of some they've got diabetes and also honey is believed to be a a, a medicinal and actually everyone li loves honey and uh, ours is to increase from the 200 beehives that we have right now to about 400 to 500 beehives in two areas wind longer and Kabombo districts. Um, why have we ventured in honey? Because honey it has been main dominated uh, business. So we thought as women or as a woman, I have to go into it and compete with the men. And I have found that uh, uh, we, we are doing very, very well. And uh, recently we had some three uh, MOUs with the uh, Chinese companies. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we couldn't go further, but we are still talking. 
coming to the locals, actually they buy our honey, so we supply our honey to the end users. And uh, we have uh, found that uh, if we are supported in a, a processing machine, we actually we are looking for a, a medium a processing plant that can process honey and purify it and uh, meet the international market. Because from our 200 beehives, we get 20 liters of, of, uh, of honey per beehives. So you find that we have got almost 4,000 liters of beehives, but still more, it cannot reach the international market. Hence our applying for a loan, I mean for the, for the support of $25,000. Thank you. Oh, how much was that? Uh, $5,000? $25,000. We wanted to have the processing, a medium processing plant. Okay, very good. And how much revenue are you doing right now? Uh, we sell our, our honey. It's, uh, um, for 20 liters, we sell it at about uh, five, uh, 820 a uh, quacha that means i think about 30 or 40 dollars per, per 20 liters as for now we have um i think so we have gone up to about 400 300 300 and 350 400 so we, we are trying to see to um we are catching up we are coming up because we just started last year and we have seen that we are already uh, in the market and also our international partners or people from other countries, they are talking to us to uh, supply them with their honey because our honey actually is organic honey. We, it's not a, a manufactured honey. It is straight from the forest, thick forest of Northwestern province. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um... You know, I just want to commend you, Grace, uh, really, really great, uh, you know, your story. And there's a lot of demand for unadulterated, unadulterated honey, because you find there's lots of honey that has got sugar, it's got, you know, other adulterated products in it. And I like that you're going organic. There is a huge need for medicinal purposes and also for just healthy clean. You know, that, uh, you know, demand for that type of honey is important. I think when you tell your story, because behind the scenes, you're talking about very unique things, especially in the context of Africa. Africa, you know, beekeeping was the reserve of men. In some areas, it was taboo for women to even climb the trees to, yeah. to put the bee, you know, up. And that, you know, you're working with women. So that's sort of like uh, broken through cultural barriers and, you know, giving work to women, empowering women to create a livelihood and an economic livelihood. And it's actually women, you know, um, engaged in the in the in the honey and, and beekeeping business. That's a good story to tell as part of your story. So just as you strengthen your, you know, your 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 submission for the next round, you know, please incorporate the story behind that, and also um, really uh, promote your brand to be speaking organic, you know, healthy honey, and and you know, we've been talking. Dr. Roland, I've been talking about a sticky brand name. Think about a brand name that, that speaks about the story behind it, or how you want people to feel. You know, that will set you apart, but very well done. I look forward to eating your honey when we're down in, uh, in Zambia in August. Yeah, I really do like honey. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, next, uh, we actually, have um, sorry. Uh, Bridget. Sorry. Yes, Grace. I I just wanted to add our honey is uh, our company is Kakanga Food Suppliers, but our brand name is Kakanga Foods. And uh, very soon, I think I'll be getting in touch, with, in touch with Jacqueline to see our brand and what how we have branded it. Actually, we have even we sent some samples to China and they have liked our honey. I didn't want to go into details because looking at the number of people and the time given to us, I thought I can just pick one through, since you have already our, our summary there with you. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So next up, can we have Kasuba? Kasuba. Kasuba, are you ready? 
I'm ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry I'm not on video because I'm having the challenge with the camera. Um, yeah. My name is Kasuba Kazembe. I'm a co-founder of Zambezi Exchange Services. And here with me, I'm with my partner, Temwaninge Gondwe. So Zambezi Exchange Services is an agribusiness company which was registered in 2016 and it only started operating in the first quarter of this year. So basically we're into farming. We've got a small land in uh, Lusaka East, which is uh, basically a rural area. So our target is um, connecting small scale farmers to the market. We've had a challenge with uh, transport and uh, our small scale farmers that side, they also have challenges to find the uh, urban market. So we want to try and connect small scale farmers direct to the markets. And uh, right now we're focusing on vegetable farming, livestock, cash crops such as uh, maize, groundnuts and soya. My partner also has something, just a few words to say. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Basically, our, our company, like the summary and, uh, has highlighted anyway, just looks at, uh, at, at uh, linking small-scale farmers you know, to market. So the idea behind this, we've noticed you know, from our experiences you know, with a few trips in the rural areas is that um, due to lack of access and a direct access to urban markets, most of the small scale farmers are not encouraged to grow more. So the essence of our, our business is just to encourage them to, to grow more by earning more. Because at the moment, most of the rural small scale farmers are earning half the price of the market, uh, of the prevailing market prices uh, in the urban areas, urban towns per se. So our rationale is that you know, as they earn more, eventually you know, rural poverty you know, will reduce and, uh, you know, because then you know, indirectly it's uh, creating uh, employment for them as they engage more in agriculture, which is the mainstay of uh, most of the people in the rural areas, you know, which uh, in total you know, accounts for about 80% of all farmers in Zambia, the, the small scale farmers. So basically, I think that's what we can say for now. So on one part, you know, we have uh, the small scale farmers as our clients, and then on the other, we, we have also the, the urban uh, buyers. So we'll be able you know, to charge uh, a, a, a small fee for using our services. And uh, our, our, our desire basically, by reason of uh, approaching your organization is, is, a, is basically to acquire, uh, to be able to acquire even a small van for starters, maybe a second hand one, then later on even a small truck so that at least uh, we can help to facilitate everything with uh, minimum costs. Then uh, we are basically looking at uh, between 12 and uh, $15,000. Very good, thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I liked as an investor, I like hearing the words cost control, <laughs> you know, being diligent <laughs> with the fund Thank you. And, uh, and, and not seeing how much we can spend, but how much can we do with little. So I, I like exactly. that. Exactly. Oh, thank you so much. So. Thank you. So up next we have Mutanga. Mutanga, and then Jennifer. Jennifer, prepare to go next. And if you're ready, Jennifer, go ahead. Mutanga can come after you. Justina, are you ready, Justina? Good morning. Yeah. Oh, yes, I am. Good okay. okay. Jennifer, you ready? Let's go with Jennifer, and then Justina, get ready to go next. Jennifer. Okay, so, so um, 
I'm 24 years old and um, I'm Zambian and based in Lusaka. Uh, currently, I'm the CEO and founder of Tosheni Enterprise. We are currently into boiler production, of which it started as something that's small. I'm, I'm still a very small scale farm, I can say, because I'm still doing it at home. So, yeah. So, um, I'm into poultry farming of broilers, and I intend to grow to getting into village chickens and so on and so forth. So, uh, currently, with the production of 200 beds per cycle, I'm able to get revenue of about 12,000. And um, in US dollars, I would say that's around $600. So uh, generally what uh, I'm asking for as a JM Tosheni Enterprise is just an increase in production investment in terms of funding. Uh, of which I, I want to grow in not really huge numbers at once because I believe in poultry farming it's about you having the right market if you have the right production. So to keep up with the consistency just as Mlenga earlier alluded to and love more there is so much inconsistency in terms of uh, poultry farming in Zambia where you have other people have their beds ready on time, others don't have them, and there's always that particular time when they're scarce, uh, there's a scarce market for, for, for broiler beds. So generally, I'm seeking funding for an increase in production of broiler beds, and um, a funding of 30,000 US dollars will enable me to upscale my capacity. Thank and you. do you have room to grow uh, where you are right now? Or would you have to buy land in order to increase? Malaka, you can't. With uh, the increase in production, I'll have to buy land because currently I'm just using an um, that I've uh, improvised as a poultry house for my beds. Okay. Okay. Very good. And that thirty thousand includes uh, cost for land to be able to do that and the additional beds. Yes, it does. The thirty thousand US dollars includes the cost of land and uh, the cost of housing as well, and getting the transport that would be required for me to move my beds from the point of production to the market. Very good. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing your business. Thank you. Thank you. Matenga, please go ahead. Mutanga is available now. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings. Hi. Okay, my name is Muntanga Madawali, and I'm the founder of Startup Enterprises based in Zambia as a branding company. Our company was established in uh, 2019, the first quarter of 2019. Uh, our, the, our, the branding services that we provide are corporate, uh, screen printing and embroidery. We are a small scale branding company that focuses on uh, medium enterprises and corporates. Our main objective is to, incre to, to increase our growth in our branding company because as of now, we do not have any equipment. We outsource our equipment, which is a bit expensive for us. So we'd like to grow our business and purchase the equipment that we need for embroidery and screen printing. We are also looking at uh, increasing our growth for focusing on uh, targeting markets like the government, which is uh, the ministries, parastatals and the local government, and also commercial, which is small to medium scale enterprises, corporates, and also NGOs. So most of our revenues come from 60% uh, of screen printing and embroidery of 40%. We are also looking at uh, providing corporate gifts to the corporate world whenever we have promotions and also events that are happening in the country. So my capital that I'm looking at to grow my business and purchase the machinery 
is sixty thousand dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Matinga. And how much revenue are you doing right now? Right now, we are doing about a hundred and twenty thousand kwacha revenues per month because okay. of COVID. But if we we are running at if we are doing the normal business is okay. Our revenues are ranging from two hundred and. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Matenga. And 60,000. Yes. Yep. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. Um, let us move to. Um, uh, has My it sign is ready. Yes. Go ahead, please. Manza? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I, I got the wrong name because the iPad I'm using is for my co-founder. So I missed it when I was called upon to talk. Uh, my name's are Jocelyn Tambatamba. I'm the co-founder for Shiv's General Dealers. My co-founder, my husband, Pastor Evaristo Tambatamba, is here with me and he's the owner of the iPad. So I was expecting my name to be called apparently his name was called so i didn't pick it <laughs> we are doing we are in food production basically bakery and i'm glad it has already been explained very early we started our business in uh, 1991 with various kind of other businesses that helped us to come to what we are today with the main objective of coming to establish a standing in uh, business which is the bakery now, and the opportunity giving us in the Northwestern province, there's a new district called Kalumbila District. It's a green uh, place, green field, and after gathering all our resources, we have land that, we, that was secured, one hacker, on which we have put a manager's house, because we knew we were going to do this thing uh, by and by. So we did first the manager's house to give us uh, a, a, a security and also a beginning time. So with this opportunity coming in, we thought we should now venture into the actual business, which is building up a bakery, which will supply the Northwestern province, especially the newly formed Kalumbila district. It was formed in 2018. And right now, all bakeries, all confectionaries come from Solwezi, which is about 200 kilometers from there. So there are two mines in there, the Kalumbila itself, and also the uh, Barik Lumwana, that has employed over 8,000 employees. Then we have also um, a lot of uh, government offices there, they, they actually, the council is also building up housing that should also house people that are working in that area. So this is a startup as in the direction of the bakery and we're trying to see if we can be funded to actually construct the bakery, have fittings in there and start supplying bread to the locals and as well as to the outside of Kalumbila so that uh, we establish a bakery as a startup in that place. So what we are asking for is about 665,000 uh, USD. This will go into the construction of the bakery, the construction of uh, the maintenance yard because we expect to have transport to deliver bread in various areas of uh, nearby as far as Kasempa, which is also again another hundred kilometers away from the place where the bakery will stand. Then from there we need a startup for the initial period for us to do the, the supplies to would-be customers already who are getting their bread and confectionaries from Solways, which is a hundred or two hundred kilometers from the furthest point that we intend to supply. So we've been looking at the market. The market is ready because people come to Solwezi 200 kilometers or 100 kilometers to come and fetch 
for this product. And we know uh, a number of people that are within that area that they would need this um, package for them to do whatever else, like the locals, they would also want to do business, which would come and get from a resale price and then they go and sell to other areas of their life. So this is a startup and we would love that we are funded and we should be able to do whatever it is that needs to be put on the ground. Land is already planned and all we need to do is to seek permission to build from the council because at that point we know that this now should begin to grow and should begin to be established. Otherwise, everything else is in place. Very good, thank you. And, and the request was, uh, was that 65,000 US or 665,000 US? 665,000 US. Okay, uh, I, I would just encourage you to look at those figures to make sure that that is exactly what you need to, to get started and to start producing revenue. Because on a startup, they may not want to fund the, a full amount for a startup. They may just say, okay, we want to fund, uh, you know, the, the, the bakery to be able to do the, make the bread and the delivery yes. vehicle to be able to deliver um, and sell. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can do that for 50,000 or for 100,000, you know, and maybe then you need additional uh, capital in 12 months or six months or you know exactly and you kind of do it in stages so maybe be thinking in your mind uh that may be what the whole project costs but in your mind break it down Please to know out. what minimum yes. you accept and then kind of where that would get you so thank you so much uh it's thank you i get that and thank, thank you very for, much would yes yes we, thank you we will we'll do that actually it's phased out like you have rightly put it the building should come first, then from there afterwards the fixtures, then from there after we have launched, then we start the bakery. So it's phased out according to what you have said and we really appreciate that we, when this is start, then we'll go into all the legalistic, the legal aspects and put them in place and start the building. Otherwise the land is ready and it's ready to be constructed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. We appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm grateful that I've been given this opportunity because we sent in our project very late. So we are really appreciate that you fixed us up and we are able to talk and discuss our project. Thank you Thank for your you. intelligence. Thank you. Uh, Justina, would you please uh, go? Hi, Justina. Uh, let me, uh, un one moment. You can hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, my name is Justina. I'm the co-founder and project director for Omega Foods. Omega Foods is an agro-processing company that was opened in 2015 after I noticed the need for health and nutrition in Zambia. Um, we deal in basically uh, local grains. We process them into flour and um, we blend them into different types of porridge. We supply them into different markets. Currently, we are, we've, we've, uh, we've gone into some of the bigger chain stores in Zambia. Um, when we opened in 2015, we started our, we entered the market in 2017. Our capacity was very small, so because of that, um, we started with the smaller minimats. But 2018, we we did build our our capacity and we joined. We entered into the bigger minima, uh, bigger chain stores, and we saw a a very great growth. Between 2017, we started, we started with uh, $10,000 a year. And um, by the end of 2019, our, our, our revenue had increased to $50,000 per year. Uh, when we saw the capacity of our business, we, we, we bought a piece of land, we have built a plant. 
where we have actually took advantage, we took advantage of the COVID-19 to move our business to our plant. And uh, by next Monday, we start operation in our own plant. Uh, we are looking for $200,000. We have um, employed a, a marketing model where we, we have engaged independent uh, sales agents to take care of our smaller minimarts. When we started, I said that we initially concentrated on the smaller minimarts because of the capacity that we had. And um, we have over 200 minimarts in Lusaka. So our independent sales agents are going to concentrate on taking care of our minimarts. Because when we joined the um, big chain stores, we couldn't be able to manage both the, the chain store demand and the minimum demand. So the, our sales agents now are going to be taking care of our minimum as we take care of, our, of the bigger chain stores. So we are looking for the $200,000 to increase our working capital. We also want to perfect our marketing strategy. Currently, we have two uh, three-wheeler bikes that are taking care of our minimats. But because we don't have a bigger truck, we outsource uh, uh, distribution for the bigger chain stores. So we would want to get a truck to, be, to help us distribute to the chain stores. We, would also, we have also um, engaged one of the bigger companies that do pre-cooked products. Our, project, our uh, porridge uh, blend is not pre-cooked. So what we have done is we have uh, done an MOU with them and they are pre-cooking our products because most of our customers ask, they like our pre-cooked, uh, I mean our porridge, but it's not pre-cooked and we don't have the capacity for that. So we have uh, come into an MOU with this company and they are going to be pre-cooking our products and we are also going to be marketing their soya product. So yeah, basically, that is it for Omega Foods. This is very well done, Justina. Congratulations on a successful business and for taking advantage of uh, the COVID as opposed to using it as an excuse. So uh, my congratulations to you on that. Um, for everyone's benefit on the call, when I see a business that is at this point um, and needing this amount of investment compared to some of projects that are untested, unknown, very uh, risky because there's no revenue yet, um, and, and they're only needing 200000 that's a lot safer of an investment for investors than if there's no revenue and, you know, and they're wanting, you know, twice that. Uh, so as you're looking at your project, that's why I encourage you to really look at your project and compare it to if you were the investor, uh, which of all of the projects you hear would you invest in? If I can take put 200,000 here and get a great return, or I can put 2,000 somewhere else, and I don't know if I'll ever see my 200,000 again, much less a return. So just think through that, uh, and there's not a right or wrong, and uh, different investors like, you know, have a different appetite for risk. Uh, and it also depends on whether you do debt financing, equity financing, or revenue share. Each one of those changes the, the dynamic in the landscape, and they may be willing to do one versus another, but uh, it would be competitive. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, our investors, uh, they only will do something if it's a win-win because they don't ever want to put hardship on the business because then they won't get their money back. So it has to, it has to uh, make sense, and the business has to be able to afford the, if it's debt, they have to be able to afford, you know, some type of repayment. Uh, and then on the equity side, the main thing investors want to know is how am I going to get my money back? Which, and how they ask you that is they will say, what is your exit strategy? Uh, even if you don't plan to sell the business, you have to think through how will your equity investor ever be able to realize uh, a return on their investment? So uh, just some things to think about. Justina, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for the overview on your on your business and congratulations to uh, Omega on their success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Bertha, if we may move to you or Betty Shalande, if you'll be ready as well, or whoever has not gone. 
Um, yes, can you hear me? I can, thank you, please go. Okay, okay, so my name's Bertha Malingua. I'm a pharmacist by profession. I recently relocated, to, well, not recently, um, within the last two years, I relocated to Zambia from the UK. Um, so the purpose of this business plan is basically to raise capital for the development of 500 hectares of um, land um, that's um, located in Kasama, northern Zambia. Um, and um, the plan is to grow avocados for the export market. Um, the founders of Hanzara are uh, myself, um, Bertha Malingua, my husband Pete. Um, and you know, Hanzara is planning to venture into the avocado farming for export purposes, having realized the demand for the Hass avocado, a medium sized berry weighing around 250 grams. And owing to its taste, size, and shelf life, and high growing yield, and in some places year round harvesting, the Hass cultivar is the most popular commercial avocado worldwide, and demand for this variety continues to rise. Um, in 2017, the global avocado market was valued at about 13 billion US dollars and is forecasted to reach more than 23 billion by um, 2027. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the primary revenue generation um, for this business will come from large scale farming of avocados. Um, and we're also for the export market. Um, so we're looking to develop a state-of-the-art avocado farm on the 500 hectares of um, farmland in Kasama. And obviously to create employment and empower local communities as well in um, avocado farming. Because I think in Zambia, I think most farmers are really focused on grains, you know, growing grains. And fruit is not sort of an area um, where a lot of um, local farmers focus on, you know, hence why we actually import the majority of, you know, our fruits, um, say so from South Africa, etc. Um, so um, Hanzara will target the export um, avocado market, um, which, which is growing. Um, currently, the main supplier, for example, to the European market is Peru, followed by Chile, South Africa, Mexico, and Kenya, um, or are increasing their supply to um, um, globally, um, because the demand for the Hass avocado um, continues to increase. Um, the limiting factor um, for us is um, clearly funding, um, is a limiting factor uh, in further pursuing this project, and hence our focus to seek investors in developing on the 500 hectares um, land. Um, financial focus, so um, I think we worked out about approximately $1.5 million. Um, this is the estimate for the total annual production cost that includes harv harvesting, um, um, land preparation, seed selection, sourcing, irrigation, crop growth, fertilizing, harvesting, um, including um, farm machinery and labor. Um, Do you already own the so, 500 hectares? Sorry? Do you already own the 500 hectares? Uh, yes, in the process of changing to the title at the moment. Okay. okay. Yes. Let me ask this, uh, and then we need to move to the, the next business. Uh, what are you prepared? Are you looking at the future of farming as well? Because I know in many of these regions, uh, they are looking at aquaponics. They're looking at how they can grow enough food for a city. Mm -hmm in the size of a 10 by 10 room because of how fast they're able to grow things in controlled spaces and controlled environment by layering and tiering and you know all kinds of modern farming strategies so instead of the old kind of traditional buy land seed selection the the significant expense with irrigation the significant risk of a failed crop or a rainstorm or something you know devastating the crop uh, there are controlled uh, processes now where you eliminate a lot of that risk. So are you looking towards that as well? Um, it's an area I'm sort of considering exploring, um, not maybe currently because um, the vision was to sort of um, start the farming on the current land but yes I appreciate there's more modern ways of farming and it's it, it's an area that we're looking to explore as well. 
Sure. Okay. No, the great. And I love uh, the, the, uh, that you've chosen avocados. I do think it's a, it's a global niche and, uh, and of course, Africa is uniquely positioned, uh, soil quality and so forth. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Justine. Uh, th thank, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Zambia has the climate for it as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Michelle? Mr. Roland, I have some thoughts for uh, Bafa on, on avocado. Um, well done, Bafa. I think, uh, you know, just like Dr. Roland has said, globally, that's the niche, niche, niche uh, product. And maybe perhaps also think about the next higher value chain in the avocado, um, you know, value chain. Looking at value addition, the avocado oil, there's a high demand for avocado oil. Um, you know, some of the medicinal values that come out of the avocado seeds. If you could take a look at some of those things so that you're embedding them in your business model as you go yeah. so that you maximize on waste and post-harvest waste and, you know, yeah. um, actually begin a product line, you know, out of those, those areas from the onset. So just some thoughts yeah. for you on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Roland. Over to you. Hi, Dr. Roland. Can I come in? Uh, yes, uh, Naiken, is that fine for us to take one more? Yeah, no, go ahead. Yes, I think um, we've got, yeah, at least one or two more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I had to budge in because I didn't want this to go by before I speak. Um, my name is Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel Lukanda. I'm from a company called Equity Property Limited. Um, Equity Properties Limited is basically um, tiered in two sections. One is uh, property development, which is not going to be part of this project, but the other one is agro trading and capacity building uh, for, for our young farmers and um, you know, women in rural areas. And um, the project is um, basically designed to um, purchase um, grain products and the grain products we're talking about include maize, soya beans, and um, groundnuts and sunflower. And um, we identified some of these projects uh, products um, because of the lack of availability on the market. And um, we are uh, cognizant to the fact that the demand is is quite huge, and um, there is very little. Um, uh, uh, you know, production. And uh, we would like to go into this one and um, see how we can enhance uh, production as well as um, uh, uh, marketing models. So basically, uh, what we are looking for is financing to build warehousing for storage, number one. Secondly, is financing for the operating capital. The capital inlay into this project is quite huge because um, for grain uh, storage, you actually need some sort of specialized warehousing. It's not just ordinary warehousing, specialized warehousing where you can control moisture, you can control pest, and you can control all sorts of um, damage that can be caused to grain. Um, looking at the agriculture industry in Zambia, it is growing day by day, and most of um, um, the people that are into this uh, sector are small scale farmers. Our model is to get into there give out um, the education, you know, how to improve productivity on uh, very small pieces of land, and also uh, provide the market for the product. Uh, you will note that um, most of our small scale farmers have a problem in terms of transportation of their product. And we would like to do this at a much, much larger scale. We will be looking at um, a radius of about 150 kilometers in a specific area. Specifically for this project, it's going to be in Eastern province, Lundazi to be in particular. Lundazi cutters for about 40% of maize production in Zambia. So that's our market. Our model is that um, we go in, we start with sensitizing the small scale farmers, teaching them how to do um, uh, good production, um, conservative production, and then buy their product. We have competitors, yes, and most of them are small time um, uh, businessmen. And also we've got the local uh, uh, businessmen of Asian origin. They're doing quite well. They've got capital that they can sit on. And so they, the only time they come in is at harvest time. We would like to go in at production time. If possible, we would like to not only just teach, but also fund 
and then we buy the product from them. We've got the market and our market is, as you may be well aware that we have a lot of fish farming um, industry that is uh, uh, springing up here in Zambia. Aquaculture is getting up and they have a problem to source their primary product for uh, manufacture of uh, fish feed. Uh, we've got uh, meeting companies, as you know, Staple Food in Zambia is um, uh, Shima, which is made out of uh, Mele Mele, which is uh, Mele Cake. And, and so um, the millers have a problem where to source, especially in times of, say, three, four months after harvest, because um, there is no proper storage. So everybody that harvests immediately goes into selling the product without, uh, you know, uh, looking after it well, to see how long it can stay on the market and stuff like that. And uh, our other uh, uh, market uh, is um, the stock feed. You know, a lot of people are doing um, uh, cattle rearing, piggeries. I've heard here yeah, there's a lot of people that are looking into uh, bed uh, keeping. And so those are our targets. When we have the maize in stock, we are able to supply to manufacturers of these products. So it's a whole chain that we are looking at. But we are going to uh, basically concentrate on, on, um, on, the, on the grain itself. Sunflower, soya beans, these are products that are now sought after and the demand is quite huge. So we would like to enhance production, help enhance production to the uh, uh, small scale farmers, then buy the produce. When we buy the produce, perhaps add a little value to it, of course, in terms of quality and we have the market to sell it to. Cooking oil industry is opening up in Zambia. They need soya beans, they need ground nuts, they need sunflower. And so our financing that we are looking at is um, basically to do the infrastructure and transportation is $650,000. This is going to cater for the construction of at least three warehouses, two in the place where we are going to sort the commodity, and one in Lusaka where when we bring all this commodity, we must store it here for onward um, selling. Basically, the huge part of this project is commodity trading. Um, the second part of this um, uh, project is going to be maybe two years after or three years after, depending on how things go, is going to be capacity building. We are going to go into capacity building in the sense that we are going to start farmer outgrowers. So we can identify a commodity, for instance, tobacco. Whilst the world market is, is shrinking for, for tobacco, quite understood, but we still have a lot of pockets that are, are, are coming up. So tobacco is a very, very uh, lucrative business. And as we speak now, there's a lot of uh, tobacco activities going on on floors, on auction floors. And so we can look at farmers that are willing to get into that uh, industry give them the education they need for that, fund them, then we buy the product and we will sell to the tobacco companies. There is very little market for tobacco companies, I mean, for tobacco growers in rural areas, but there is a huge market for tobacco in uh, town areas, like urban areas like Lusaka, because all the buying companies are based in Lusaka. And what they've done is they've centralized their buying because I think it's a cost cutting measure on their part. So farmers have to move their product from wherever they're doing it from into Lusaka. Similarly, even the, even the, uh, the grain crops and so on, uh, buyers have stopped going to the farmers. They're not reaching out because of cost conscious most likely, but we have a model that once we establish warehousing storage for grain, where grain can be stored for let's say three, four months after harvest, we have a very good market for it here because the market is yearning for it. Other than the local market, we've got the export market. We know that Mozambique is dying for maize, groundnuts, as well as uh, soya beans. Namibia, they're doing very well in the, uh, you know, in the animal husbandry and most of their maize brand for production of their stock feed comes from Zambia, all right? So we know that that's a market for us, both soya beans, maize, and maize, uh, as well as uh, sunflower. The Congo deer is in dire need for maize. So the market is huge. And Zambia being um, one of the blessed countries with a good climate, fresh water, and the hardworking people, more especially the people in the rural areas, we feel that we can you know, leverage on those qualities of um, the country's uh, natural uh, outlook 
in terms of weather and everything else. And that uh, if we put this project into uh, wheels, we would probably be um, sitting on the, you know, on a very good project. Thank you. So Did basically you in summary, that's what I can tell you. Yes, thank you. I have one question and we must move on. Uh, uh, the question is, are you generating any revenue today? Are you generating revenue? Hello, Dr. Roland. I, can, I can't hear you. Are you there? Yes, we're here. Are you generating revenue now? Okay. Uh, Ezekiel, do not worry. We will uh, get, uh, we have the information on your business and uh, Michelle will be, able, you know, will be able, the team will be able to continue moving things forward. But thank you for sharing uh, your passion. Nikon, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Roland, and thank you all the enterprises for sharing with us your story, your enterprises, and uh, where you're at, even your expectations. I hope you've taken the feedback that we have been giving so far Hello. to continue your institution. Yeah, Betty, uh, we'll get back to you shortly. We'll give you a chance to speak shortly. We just want to move on to the next stage, but we will give you a chance to speak just before okay. um, we conclude. Okay, we'll give you a chance to speak before we conclude. Yeah, so just uh, back to the, to the process. One of the big objectives for, uh, for the call at this time is to um, invite Michelle Mwaka, who's representing the technical and appraisal teams that have been working with uh, all the projects for all the countries, to just give um, you know, a highlight of the process this far, what they have observed from your, your submissions, um, what, what you need to do, some of the recommendations, and uh, highlight some of the next steps. And then just before we conclude, Betty, we will give you a, a, you know, a little uh, moment to speak a little bit about your institution. Thank you. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Nyakan. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with Zambia. Um, I would like to note that Zambian entrepreneurs really know what they want. Like for sure, as we go through these executive summaries, we are very sure about this one thing. You have identified your, the problem, you have the solution for it, and you know what you need for it. So without further ado, I'll just give you a brief on the process. So when we receive your executive summaries, we do a preliminary review, and the preliminary review just looks at the basics. Uh, these basics are, are um, the first thing is the purpose. We identify what is, what is it that you're applying for and what is it for. So basically you will have to explain a brief on the problem or the area that you have, you have identified that you, you would like to solve. And then now the objective where now you have your solution and the amount you need to do that. And then we look at a breakdown. Some were able to give a breakdown in the executive summary, but some weren't. However, we will require a breakdown. The, sec the other thing is um, your marketing and distribution channels. It's, it's important to address that. I, I heard someone saying that they will be um, connecting the farmer to the market, but they didn't really explain their marketing and distribution channels. And if, if someone looking at it would just think that you're just any regular middleman, and I know that that's not the story. You have a reason, you know what your competitive advantage is, you know very well and clearly. So that needs to come out clearly in, the, uh, in your executive summary and the feasibility study that I will touch on next. We were also looking at brief cash flow projections, of which most of you were able to give a two, three year projection of your revenues and what your margins are so we are able to know you know what your profits will be but some are not able to capture that in the executive summary and it is key however i will touch on that later on um, we were also looking at past performance some were able to tell us what their past revenue was and what they're expecting their future revenue to be of course this is 
should you get funded, you expect that you will increase your revenue by X, by a hundred thousand dollars, by you know that that that's very important to note. Now, the next stage after this is a deep analysis. Now, with a deep analysis, we will require supporting documents over and above now what you have in your executive summary what will happen is you will uh we require those that are not polished that don't have the basics that are not looking you know you've not touched on the competition but actually most of them have mentioned the competition but some haven't mentioned what their competitive advantage is what is what is your unique value proposition for your project so some need to identify that however most of them were very clear on that and even listening to everyone who has spoken on this call you clearly all know you all know who your competition is but it also needs to be clear for the the analyst who is looking at your piece of paper and they have not yet come into contact with you and even the people who are going to review this prior to the investor being being here um, with that said, I would like to go to the frequently asked questions before I move on to uh, the checklist. So the frequently asked questions, I would like to project this Nyakan. So I will share my screen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sure. I believe that we can all see the screen now. Are we able to see my screen? Frequently asked questions. Yes. So yes. this will help you understand the checklist that will come next. And the first question will be, is it mandatory to have all the requirements in the checklist? Now the checklist consists of basic requirements and it is necessary to adhere to the maximum number of documents that you can obtain in relation to your project. Uh, is it, the second question is, is it mandatory to add the industry required documents? Yes, it is. You need supporting documents. You're in mining. You need your licenses in order. You need to attach them. You're in construction. You need your uh, environmental assessment certificate. You need um, whatever other statutory legal requirements for that same industry. So yes, please attach everything you have. Um, how far and deep should I go in submission of project details? Please provide as much information as you can. The investor is your partner. I believe that we need to be transparent in every partnership. Yeah, so provide what you can. Uh, how many will be funded per country? Now, as many as the investors deem fit, it's all about you strengthening your proposal for consideration. Uh, there's a notion that many project owners submit their documents, but very few get chosen. Is this true? No, it ain't true. Um, investors settle for projects that satisfy their investment appetite. So you just focus on your project, strengthen it, and ensuring that you're able to elaborately define your project. Um, Dr. Roland kept asking many people, what's your revenue? And you're stuttering. You're not supposed to start you need to know what your revenue is from the top of your head just pick it up this is my revenue and this is going to be my future revenue and this is what i need to bridge that gap and you know this machinery will increase my revenue it has to flow out of you very quickly it just it just needs to be part of you um the next question is how confidential are the products being handled during the virtual calls and selection mm -hmm. process the project proposals are only privy to the current TWW team and the applicants are not privy to each other applicants proposals and team leaders, even they themselves are only privy to what is necessary. The other question is what do I expect on the virtual call? Now the virtual call, this is it. You need, uh, you expect that by the time I'm done, I'll have given you a preliminary feedback, which I will go through it through the, uh, in the checklist and the technical team will highlight the strengths and weaknesses of the proposals of which 
Nyakan and Dr. Roland have been speaking about it over and over from the beginning. You know, every time you would say something, they would ask you questions, noting most of the important staff. What is the next step after the virtual call and preliminary review? The next step is a second review that involves a deeper analysis, a dipstick analysis of the project where supporting documents are required as for the checklist, and that's what I'll address next. How do we address language barriers with the main language being English? I don't think Zambia has this challenge. I think that's from other countries because from what I've had, we are all okay and all the executive summaries are just very eloquently written. How many submissions will make it to the end? Everybody, it, it's all about you. It's only you who can decide how you, you, know, you make it to the end. Just strengthen and ensure you are there to everything that is required and that you understand your business, the industry you're in, and how you're plugging in. What, what features should my proposal have? On a bare minimum, your proposal should have the purpose, the objective, the amount you require, a breakdown of funds, your marketing and distribution channels, the competition and your competitive edge, cash flow projections, statistics of past performance because many are looking to scale up or you know so you need to show what you have been doing in the past so that we can look at the future as well and how you're projecting for it and lastly supporting documents number 12 is what happens if we don't have internet access during the virtual tour we request that you have uh, uh, contact your team leader and they will advise you accordingly because they have already captured whatever is required and the highlights and the communication. And they will guide you through the process as well, even though we're walking through the journey with you. Uh, how do I go about country statutory requirements? Well, from what I've had, most of everyone in Zambia knows where to get what they want. You know, they know where they're at, they know the requirements of the industry. Most of everyone is actually experienced in some way or another, so I don't think that will be a challenge because we all know where our government offices are, but for those who don't have, team leaders can advise as well. What do I need to do if I have projects in different countries? If you do have projects in different countries, attend all the virtual tours of those countries. Attend all of them because the team leaders are different and the guidance will be different. If someone already has an existing loan from a bank or a microfinance, do they still qualify for funding? Yes, you do. All you need to do is reflect, is um, show your repayment ability. I had mentioned cash flow projections, past financials. We want to see that you have been paying your loans and you will still pay the new one that comes through and that you're able to sustain based on what your proposal is about. Um, and lastly, small businesses might, have, might not have financial audited accounts. Will they stand a chance? Yes, they do. Small businesses should present their management accounts for the past couple of years that they've been in business. Now, basic accounts show that they're, they're basic. You know, you just have your revenue, your expenses, and your margins. And, and that, that's it. And we move on to the next year. So just share what you have yeah with that said i'll move on to the checklist now so this is the basic checklist of documents required for the second phase that you're supposed to submit in a few weeks the first thing is your application letter stating the kind and value of assistance required, which would be your executive summary. So please fill in the blanks. We've already said what a basic summary needs to have. So just fill in the blanks and ensure what you're resubmitting this time. They will be looked at again. So you have an opportunity to fix what you hadn't fixed the first time. So resubmit with that. Then there's the second thing is a well-documented project proposal or feasibility study. You're in mining, we need a feasibility study. You're in construction, of course we need one, you know? Some of them, like in the services industry, if your business is so clear, it can be captured on your... Michelle? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, would you kindly share the checklist? We still have the frequently asked questions um, on the screen. Could you 
share the checklist, please? Could you share the screen for the checklist? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, okay, just a sec. Just yeah. a sec. Okay, so I think it's coming up now. You'll be able to see. I can see guys smiling, so I think you've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sure. So I'll start again. So there's the application, which is your executive summary and should have the basics. And we have touched on the basics and the FAQs. Then we have the well-documented project proposal, our feasibility studies. So that just shows what your project is about, how you're gonna make money to the end and how you're gonna pay it back. Then we have certificate of incorporation and it's corporate shareholders. So please share that. Actually the next step is statutory requirements, legal statutory requirements for any business to operate. That includes now your certificate of incorporation, memorandum and articles or related documents certified um, ID copies or passport copies of the shareholders and directors and um, tax certificates as well. And we have CVs of shareholders and directors. Now, some people um, might have started their business like two, three years ago and don't have so much to show in terms of experience, but you've been working in the industry in management and like if you're in hospitality you've, you've done management you've done you know front office you've done you have the experience your cv actually sets you apart so please do share that then we need current management accounts now like for small businesses as i had mentioned you might not have your audited accounts so when we say current management accounts it includes all your accounts for like the last three years yeah for you current management is all the last three year management accounts but for the organizations that have been in business for a while, current management would be 2020. And for some of those who also don't have audited for 2019, those are still current management accounts. The next thing would be three year audited accounts of the entity that is uh, seeking for funds and cash flow projections. I will get back to that one now. We require the entity having obtained in its sole name all approvals, consents, authorizations, licenses, certificates from appropriate authorities, institutions, and persons to conduct business. You know, if you're a doctor, we need your medical license. If, you know, if you're a lawyer, we need all that and even relate in relation to the entity as well. Sources and evidence of equity contribution. Someone said that they have only bought the land. That's, that's your equity contribution to the project, you know, that, you, that that's an asset that you have bought, you have already invested something in the project. So that's evidence. You can share maybe the sale agreement or the process where you're at, at acquiring the property, yeah? And that means that if your project required $200,000, land was probably a portion of it. So you require the difference. That's an example. So if it was $200,000, that land you just bought was $100,000. So your requirement is another $100,000. Let, let that one be very clear. Yeah. Um, the other thing would be certificate of all mandatory contributions, which is tax. Yeah. Tax is key. We need to pay our taxes. Um, environmental impact assessment. I guess that was for everyone who requires it, mining, construction, and any other related uh, industry that requires that. The other thing, number 14, would be proof of legal registered address or proof of operational address. Now, the businesses are already operating somewhere. Now, that location, the proof could be a lease agreement in the business name or the director's name. If the, you don't have that, you could have utility bill, you know, water, electricity, something that shows that your business is there in either the business name or the director's name. Kindly note very well, if it's not in the business name, 
please note as you're ch ticking your checklist, because everyone will get a checklist, as you're ticking, please write that it's not in your business name because it was registered in the director's name. Just write that clearly. Um, if, it, if, if your business is located in your residential home, also note the same. Just, just clearly state what, what, what the situation is. Number 15 would be ID documents of members of the board of directors and senior management. Someone is building a hospital. They don't have, they're not medics. So what would happen? We would need ID or whatever documents of the people who are gonna run the project. So the medics, the professionals who will be running the project are the ones who we will need there. Over and above the owners, over and above the shareholders, we will need the people running the project. And their CVs and yeah. Proof of address of members of the board of directors, the same applies, the same applies as number 14. And that is just a basic checklist, a basic checklist. It's not tailor-made to any industry. It's what everyone should somehow provide or at least try and achieve the maximum number that you can provide. That said, I will jump into the industry requirements. Now, these are basic, basic industry requirements. I will share my screen on the basic requirements just now. I think we can all see the industry requirements, right? Okay, so yes. Yes. it's not limited to what I have written here, yeah? This, this is not limited to, but this is just a guide that you're in construction over and above your certificates and stuff, you need a bill of quantities. You need a list of major assets and equipments owned by the company, you know. Over, it's just the things to add on. They're just add-ons to ensure that your supporting documents support your project accordingly, you know. They strengthen your project. As we said, everyone gets to the finish line, but it's how you have strengthened and supported your document and how well you're able to execute that. So, in construction, um, most of the people who are in construction have already started. So they have this, they have a bill of quantities, they have um, uh, professional indemnities from the architects, the engineers. So the list is there over and above the things I asked when the, in the basic checklist, kindly or, uh, offer the other things. I'll go to ICT, ICT, there's, over and above the basic requirements, we require qualification and experience of key personnel. It's, it's a service industry um, project, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sector in the service industry, so the requirements might be less. However, we'll need your permits. In fact, everyone needs a permit, you know, everyone actually needs a permit. Um, I will go down to the trading sector. In trading, you could be in import export. So licenses are applicable. Licenses are applicable. You could add an economic diversification drive where applicable. So this list is only to guide extras on the extras applicable in every industry. I will go down to, oh, one important thing. There is something everyone should provide. Details of any current litigation in which the car, the company, the project is involved in. Yeah, that's applicable to everyone. If there is a litigation, it's important to share the same so that the partner is aware, you know, they're not shocked somewhere in between. Um, health sector. Now, over and above, if, if you're buying and selling a uh, Equipment, you will need the import export licenses. You will, if you're in the practice itself, you will need your medical licenses, medical board licenses, and any other qualification licenses of the experience of the personnel and statutory licenses as per the requirements. I will continue skimming through services sector. I think the, it's a duplication of most of them. Hospitality might have a few extras, you know, we have a food handlers certificate, professional guide certificate, trophy dealers licenses, environmental impact licenses, occupation permits. 
So whatever relevant certificates are required, please share them. Now, some of them are tour operators. If you're in a tour operator, please give us a copy of the logbooks, copy of the logbooks of the cars that are uh, in, the, uh, in the business, that are already owned by the business or the directors. Um, for those in air and sea, we have airworthiness and seaworthiness certificates where applicable. Um, we have agriculture, again, we have agricultural related certificates, yeah? We have animal transit permits, animal slash wildlife import permits, horticultural product permits, livestock permit, dry grade permits, and just to mention but a few. So please, uh, we will share this. Everyone will actually get checklist and industry requirements together with the feedback of the preliminary review. That said, I would like to go to how the feedback of the preliminary review looks like. 